On this episode, we discuss Jude Devereaux's Sweet Liar. There's no non-consensual sex in this book, but there is a lot of violence against women and also other people, although it's not perpetrated by the hero. Uh, there's also some discussion of, um, of sexual trauma, although it's sort of like theoretical sexual trauma, and there is some emotional abuse experienced in the past by the heroine. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. How's everybody doing? It's December. Right now, I can't even think of it being December. Right now, what it is, is two weeks of finals hell. Like, that's where I am. This is the point. Everybody's like, oh, you work with college students. Like, oh, no, no, no. They're, you know, they're adults. No. Everybody loses their goddamn mind. And I have already had to break up two fights. I've had a girl scream crying. Not not just, like, not quiet tears. Not, like, suffering in silence. But, like, scream crying in front of the printer. Let me clarify for the studio audience. Um, when you say fights, you don't just mean, like, people saying mean things, do you? No, I mean, like, actual fights. Like, lifting up the shirt, squaring away, doing the, what's up? What's up? What's up? You know, who's going to push you? Who's, who, the, the pushing has commenced. Mm. Who's going to throw the punch? Mm. And... You can tell, like, when I just don't even care, because yeah, I used to, I used to love a fight. Yeah. One of the best fights that ever happened fight, was fight, 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 fight. I was in high school, and there were two girls with the same last name. They weren't related, fighting over a guy, mm. and the little one. I, I always <laughs> pick the little one in a fight. I always oh, pick the yeah, little they're one because they're me. Oh my god! So the little one threw the bigger one into the glass tr- trophy case. So, what? like, I have a high bar for fights. Yeah, right. Yeah, but this one, I'm just like, oh, my God, y'all go outside, and I'm calling campus p- police. I have no time for this. Take this outside. I just assigned that, right? Yeah, like, so I'm just, yeah. We've had some recent poop students at the public library, but I was not there for any of them, so if I'm not there, it doesn't really count. I mean, I would deal with, well, I don't have to deal with the poop students, so. Except, okay, I have to say, the one that I was not there for, that I do kind of treasure and hold in my heart because it was so special is the one that happened on the escalator. Oh, that is nice. Oh, oh but it, you know what? Bless that guy's heart. Like, I bet it was an old man that just, like, I, don't, I wasn't there. I don't know. But, I feel um, like it's in bridesmaids but where it, it was she's not, like, this is happening. It was not solid. And so, you know, the election of the escalator. Oh, no. That's yes. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I feel like after next Friday for me, I'll be all holly jolly, ready for the holidays. I mean, I'm decorated, but that's just for my own sanity. Like, and when I, when she said she's decorated, Lord, y'all, Gordy decorates. <laughs> well, a lot of it was my mom, so it's like a little homage to my mom. So she was a big decorator too. We actually just put the Christmas ornaments back in the garage, like last month. We're going to get tree number. <laughs> we're going to go get the live tree tomorrow. So tree number three. Oh my god. <laughs> I respect it so hard because, like, yeah, I do not have the the emotional, like, bandwidth to do any of it. And Courtney, like, she decorates for, like, St. Patrick's Day. I do love a holiday, so. (laughs) But, yeah. But it's in a fun way. It's not in a way that, like, annoys me. It's in a super fun way. Yay. That's just for any of y'all who are like, I think I'd like to go to library school because librarians get to sit together around in a quiet space and read all the time. Like, I have, yeah, I, And you'll see when, like, we talk about the what are we reading. Like, I haven't had to, like, basically my job has been, like, holding one person by their collar and another person, like, by their chest, like, to keep them from punching each other in the face. That's what I've been doing. Huh. So. That's well, where I am. I'm huh. sorry. That that oh, it's okay. You. <laughs> it's just the dumpster fire that is the end of the semester. Would you like me to go there and poop on the stairs just to. Yeah, please, please. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. They, they, nobody would clean it up. So no, it, it would be. Trust me, you say, oh, it wouldn't be you. It would totally be It would totally be me you. having to clean up the poop. <laughs> so after that, I, I do love a good poop joke. Um, Courtney doesn't like it as much as I do. You so. do love a poop joke. Like, yeah, that's that's kind I of do. your wheelhouse is a poop joke. Did y'all know that if you tell Alexa to fart, she'll do a new one every time? I mean, I'm, I'm so glad that you discovered that. <laughs> Sarah's always telling me about, like, fart books, and I'm just like, mm, that's nice, so... Well, there's a great, like, science one. Like, does it fart? Yes, you've told me about it several times. Oh, well, you know. But you know what? You love what you love. So, there's <laughs> things that I love that people are like, what are you talking about? So, you love holidays. I, I love, love making Alexa fart. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, I mean, like, it, okay, you can't really remember if she's doing the same one all the time. I really like, like that this, can... like, your Alexa <laughs> farting is going to be the segue into people actually paying money to listen to us. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> if you want more of this amazing content, oh my God. if you're like, geez, I really want to support these people in their endeavors, how can I buy Sarah another Alexa device so she can fart noise at in stereo? Please don't tell my five-year-old that she'll do that. Um, then you should join our Patreon. On. Several of you have already taken the jump. And so we've got some shout outs today for our wonderful and lovely Patreon members. Neil, um, who has given a $5. Wow. $5. I know. That's very exciting. Yes. Neil has also received his awesome Not Sold in Stores sticker already. You could be like Neil if you wanted to. Neil would like us to give a shout out. Actually, he's sacrificing his own shout out in favor of us giving a shout out to his lovely wife of 25 years, Diana. I think somebody should write, when you, if we have any like authors, romance authors listening, somebody should write a little novella about Neil and his love of listening to terrible romance podcasts and his love yeah. of his wife. I, I like to think like that he's his a, wife, he is the hero for us all. The, like his wife hates it. His wife was like, oh, God, is that them bitches again? She's, like, just all about <laughs> hardcore murder mystery. Yes. And she has no time for Neil's tender heart. Like, I'm giving you guys plot. I mean, yeah. it would be amazing. And she's like, there's no, like, like semen traces in this? Yes. Like, yeah. oh, God, I'm just not, not interested. So thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, and our other one that we have today is from a fellow podcast, Trashy Divorces. I love Trashy Divorces. Like, before we get to their shout-out, let me just tell y'all, Trashy Divorces is the best. Like, they handled the Giuliani divorces, and it was so good. We have talked about Danielle Steele and her amazing, crazy bookshelf. We have talked about day drinking in Charleston. Trashy Divorces is such an amazing podcast. Well, they they were uh, really nice and welcomed me when I joined this She Podcast group, mm -hmm. which is super classy of them, because everybody else on She Podcast is like, this is my personal empowerment podcast. And I'm sure they're great. Yeah. I'm sure they are lovely ladies who have wonderful, great personal empowerment podcasts. I'm not going to listen to any of them, but like, Trashy Divorces, divorces it's so me. good. Um, and they've gotten our sticker. They they posted it on Twitter, and they have, they have much more, many more Twitter followers, though. It was very nice. Well, I hope that like, their Twitter followers liked it, because my husband did a really nice job on those Yeah, they're, they're it's a cute sticker. I love the ladies of Trashy Divorces. Well, their shout out is just um, that they want us to say something about Southern podcasts supporting each other. See, I mean, Aww. how nice are they? And I, I believe... They're from Atlanta. I think you're right. So we're close, and we need to do, like, a join-up. Like, oh, my God, We talked yes. about it before, like, doing, like, a Danielle Steele oh, or yeah, Jackie like, Collins. Can, yeah, like, like, those things that are all about trashy divorces. Yeah. Like, there's always a divorce and a Danielle Steele. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're just the most fun. We both recently got retweeted by the guy who wrote St. Elmo's Fire, and we were very excited about it. So. Oh, my God. He must have just been on Twitter like one day. <laughs> so what are we drinking? So... My thematic wine for this book is a Gnarly Head Special Blend. It's called 1924, which is a key year in the book that we it read. Is, it is. Um, it's one of these bourbon barrel aged wines. You know, like, I feel like Cooper and Thief was the first one, and now, like, in Cooper and Thief, it's fairly expensive. And now there's some that are, like, coming down on the price point with this, like, bourbon barrel aged. My husband loves a bourbon barrel aged wine. <laughs> so if you need something for your whiskey bros to drink, this is a good one. Um, yeah, so 1924 Gnarly Hair, Gnarly Head Bourbon Barrel Aged. Well, um, the funny thing is we haven't told you anything about the book yet. Yeah. So what I'm going to tell you is that I got, yet again, 19 Crimes, because this matches so many of our books. Um, I got their Cabernet um, because the people in this book commit at least 19 crimes, and you knowing nothing about the book, I would like to name some of them. All right? Elder abuse. Yes. Kidnapping. Yes. Kidnapping of an elder. Yes. Assorted building, uh, like, code, code, code violations. violations. Yes. Shooting someone in half. I mean, that's, that's later or earlier. But there is someone basically is shot in half. But that's not uh, okay. Well, I like that, that, that for you by the protagonist. I like that that for you is not a crime. You're like, no, 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 no whatever. Awesome. What yeah. happened in 1928, and everybody got shot in half yeah. in 1928. There's some definite, also like illegal, tattooing of a 16 year old, illegal parking. Oh yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. lots of crimes happen. Lots of fraud. Thing. There's a, a good bit of fraud. So much fraud. Oh my god. Sarah and I decided like to make things more conversational. We take less notes, and this was the book that we decided to take less notes on. It was a mistake. Yeah, like, so much. I feel like I am like like 
discussing it, I felt like I was like cramming for like a Russian history test or like a you know like Chinese like you have to know all the dynasties now. You know, like there's a lot going on. I used to know a song for the dynasties. I will not. I will not do that to you. Um, before we get into it, what else are we reading, listening to, and enjoying? So again, right now, Courtney has no time to read anything, but she is listening to. We're call, I'm going to call him my, my, podca- my podcast boyfriend. He'll be your podcast boyfriend, too. Um, there's Deep Into History. It's hosted by Arjun, and his voice is straight out butter. Like, it's it's a really relaxing, just like one of those ASMR, like, you just mm. listen to and it takes you away. So what Arjun does is it's a podcast that explores some of history's greatest moments. But it's not just like, here's what happened. So he does it in this storytelling way. So a lot of times... He'll give you kind of like a little setup and then he does this narration and he also does soundtracks to go with it. Um, And the one that I'm listening to is a follow up of one that he did that was absolutely amazing. The first one that I would suggest is to listen to Enter Yasuke, the African Samurai. That's bananas good. And this one is Shinobi, the Tale of Hattori Hanzo. And I'm like maybe 20 minutes into it because I just listened like after I've been breaking up fights I need <laughs> I need podcast boyfriend to like relax me on no the I get home. you I, I get so you so I highly suggest you can find him on all the podcast things deep into history it's awesome he's on Twitter he's the best again it's a good like it's a good boyfriend voice too mm-hmm. So that sounds good. I'm sure he's really excited to know that he is my like unwitting like podcast boyfriend. Well, I mean, he'd rather have you than like Fart Lady McGee over here. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I am listening to, and you should listen to it as well. well. I actually have a couple that I've been thinking of. I only had one, but then as you were talking, I I was thinking I should have mentioned this on what we are drinking because I'm not drinking it now, but I did drink it recently. We are not paid to sponsor these people. I just really liked them. Um, oh yeah. yeah, there's a distillery in town that's called Crouch Distillery. And you were yes. talking about bourbon barrels. Yeah, so um, they they distill a bunch of different whiskeys, obviously. Um, and it's all South Carolina stuff. Like, uh, even their barrels now are South Carolina-made barrels. Can I make them my whiskey boyfriend? Uh, it depends. You can go and talk to them and see <laughs> if they will um, if they will provide whiskey for sexual favors. Well, here, the, again, just fair <laughs> notice, I have lots of boyfriends, so... But they don't again, all know it. It's all, yeah, it's all, it's nothing untoward. Um, but uh, their whiskey was really good, and I really like how local it was, and the guy we talked to was super nice and I learned a lot on the tour so you too should go to Crouch Distilling and you know where you can get Crouch Whiskey? Where? Morganelli's (gasps) Morganelli's No longer accepting personal checks They've been burned (laughs) They've been burned too many times You know who you are and you know what you did I mean Morganelli's The holidays are coming and again Aunt Edna didn't die before Thanksgiving last year Uh, She's not going anywhere before Christmas No and you know what they do? They get prep I mean what (laughs) What else could you need? More galleys. <laughs> um, also, I've been finally getting around to reading The Wicked and the Divine, which mm-hmm. is a graphic novel. Um, it's got a sexy lady Lucifer in it. Oh, yeah. It. It's super good. Like, if it's if you like Sandman, this is going to activate the same things you loved about Sandman. Can we just call it an SLL? Sexy lady Lucifer? Uh, well, that would be fine. Okay. I, was, I, I was down for that. I was going down for that. I like that one. Yeah, so I highly recommend it. I, I just read the first volume. I got the second volume sitting in my desk. I recommended it to a coworker, and she also now has the second volume sitting on her desk oh, cool. because it's that fucking good. Um, and I was also thinking a lot, like when we were talking about how the fuck we're gonna do this goddamn book about one of our sister podcasts on Frolic. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the Womance podcast because so they good. they did a series on chic romances and their middle one was in our time period and it was hilarious yeah. because it was one of those 500 page fucking 70s books where all these things happen but they feel like they have to explain otherwise the book doesn't make any sense right. but they get so far in the weeds and i i really they like, like us but better it's like when you know I, what was it and um oh god i can't believe i'm making this joke um Jesus. Okay. Oh, it's going to work if I can think of it. Um, I'll <laughs> tell her I'm going to edit it out, but I won't edit it no, out. No, you're not going to edit it out because it's going to, it's going to, when it lands, it's going to be really great. Um, so before Charlie Sheen became the worst. Yes. 
He was in all those spoofy movies. Uh, yeah, um, uh, not Top Gun. Jesus. You know what I'm talking about, though. Yeah, I saw it like 18 times. So there's the second kid. one. I think it's the second yeah, one. Where he's called... he's on the boat, <laughs> and his fa- Martin Sheen's on the boat, and they pass each other, and they look at each other, and they say- Hot oh, shots. Yeah, hot shots. <laughs> we're like, oh. like your aunts now. It's terrible. They're, and they're like, I loved you in Wall Street. Like, that's what we <laughs> uh-huh. are. They're- they're uh, we're obviously Charlie Sheen. Because yeah. Oh, yeah. We're trash bags, and yes. like they're professional and you know endearing and wonderful. Yeah. But we look at each other and we love each other. And we're just like an Alexa fart noise. So. Yeah. So. Yeah. But yeah, they're chic in the weeds. They get. Did they uh, somehow? I, I felt that they like accomplished better than we did at yeah. like a, like explaining a really complicated book. But if you like us, you will like them for yeah, sure. They're so good. They're they're great. And again, Frolic Network go. There's a bunch of great podcasts on there, and they keep adding more. Like just so many great people. Yes, yes, it is absolutely delightful. So, all right, Sarah, got some situations happening, and yeah. I need some advice. So. Mm-hmm. I just got divorced. <laughs> yeah? It was an emotionally abusive relationship. I don't know what to do. Yeah, he sounds terrible. You know what you should do? What? You should put on a show about it. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's something I can do. But also, like, my father passed away, but he didn't just pass away. He put, like, me in a guardianship with this hot-ass dude, and I don't know what to do about it. Well, that is a trash bag thing for him to do to you. Yeah. You know what you should do about it? What? You should put on a show about it. A show? Hmm. Um, my grandmother, I thought was dead. She disappeared. She could or could not be alive. What do I do with that? Do you think that maybe it's possible she was a, a flapper floozy? She could be. You know what I should do? You should probably put on a show about I it. I should put on a show about it. Yeah. So if you love shows, <laughs> like Courtney loves shows. <laughs> Again, this Sarah is... Sarah loves shows too, so I gotta say. This is a Courtney jam. We read Jude Devereaux, Sweet Liar. Um, and we're not really going to do about a, the author because we've already done a Jude Devereaux book before. That was Wishes. Wishes. The we- book that was all about fat shaming this poor girl, this 19th century Colorado girl. Oh, Jude Devereaux was and, amazing. And because- the dead lady in, in, in amazing dead lady purgatory. Jude Devereaux is amazing because in one hand, she will put some like serious lady empowerment. And in the other hand, she will just shit glitter. And then smashes them together yes. and rubs it and then just puts it on the wall. I bet Jude Devereaux likes a good fart joke. Oh, she probably does. Um, so, but it's Sweet Liar. The reason that we're doing this one is <laughs> our whole premise is that we read the books that we steal off of grandmother's nightstands. Yeah. This is a book that I actually stole from a grandmother. Amazing. So, where I grew up, there was twin girls that I was really good friends with that lived maybe like two blocks over. If we're going to call it blocks, it was a neighborhood. Oh, like, yeah. You had to go up a giant hill. You had to cross over the T-ball field, and their, <laughs> their house was. So I remember we were hanging out at their house, and their grandmother lived with them. She had, like, an ensuite, And we're upstairs in her ensuite watching TV, and I saw this book. It was a G. Devereaux book, and, like, G. Devereaux was my fucking jam. And I was like, Miss Grace, can I borrow this book? And she was like, yeah. And I still have the book 20 years later. <laughs> like, this is the, I gave Sarah the same copy that I stole from Miss Grace from Kelly and Shannon's grandmother. And that's what we read. So it's a little out of our time period, but we're definitely including it because, duh, it's, you stole it off I of Meemaw. I straight up stole it from a Meemaw. It was very weird for me to read this because it, it is a little bit out of our time period. And therefore, it's more in a time period, this is a contemporary romance, that I actually remember. Yeah. So I'm like, wait, this is all fucking bullshit. Or I, I love, at the same time, yeah. like, oh, yeah, that's right. When I moved to Atlanta when I was 17 and 97, I really did have to open up another, another bank account. Right. You would never do that now, right? Yeah, it's it's yeah. weird. Yeah. So the cover that I have, there's two covers. There's one that's a very Jude Devereaux, like, cozy cover. And that was a thing that was big for Jude Devereaux because, like, by this time I was buying a lot of her books. You could buy her books because they look completely innocuous. Like, they and just look like cozy mystery. If you're, yeah, if you're trying to imagine this, it's like a cozy mystery. Yeah. It looks exactly like it's got, like, um, pie or die. Yeah. Or, that's a terrible, like, like the, not even worthy of a cozy the, mystery The one pie. cover, this wasn't the cover I had. It has, like, a little, like, friendly door and, you know, an umbrella. The cover I had, this, you could tell Sweet Liar was trying to be some Danielle Steele. Mm-hmm. Because the cover I had on this hardback book, the book is purple and gray, which mm-hmm. I love, too. It is so fucking purple. And then, like... On the cover, it had, like, diamonds. Yeah. And it was Sweet Liar. 
you know, and like a hairpin. And it has, and like, you know, that kind of a very cursed, like very flourishy yes, italic. Yes, yes. And it's, and it's so got good. the author's name as large as the title. It looks like that. Yeah. And, you know, the funny thing is, I almost feel that she was trying to write a Daniel Steele, and in the middle, she just couldn't fucking stand it. Yeah. So. And it just went off the rails. So, the description. <laughs> it was her father's dying wish that Samantha Elliott search for her grandmother, who disappeared from Louisville when she was a baby. So, here she was in big, dirty New York City. Her parents were dead, her divorce was final, and she was all alone. Michael Taggart was Samantha's landlord, and he was easily the most beautiful man she'd ever seen. He was charming, too. His zest for life was so contagious that in his presence, or presence, presence <laughs> like, sorry. Well, he'd be better. Yeah. <laughs> in his presence, <laughs> Sam, you're going to love this, Sam bloomed like a flower after the rain. <laughs> yeah, Michael could only get so far with her. When he tried to get closer, it was like running into a brick wall. But Mike wouldn't give up. As they probed her grandmother's past, he was slowly uncovering the joy and affection Samantha had buried long ago. Leading them to closer to the dangerous truth about a bloody spring night in 1928 and a seductive blues singer named Maxi. Y'all, so fucking much happens in this book. There is a we're, lot. We're going to be struggling with this. Oh my gosh, yes. Because I, I can't. This can't, can't be a four hour podcast. Like, it just, we can't. Well, because like, our memory card only holds, what is it, two hours and 41 two minutes? Two hours, yeah. So. Yeah, that's what you get. I, if yeah. it stops, it stops. We're going to have to, like, I, I, I'm going to try to keep the ship righted. So. We did, we ran it out one time. Yeah. We ran it out for flowers in the attic. Yeah. <laughs> this might be, this might be close. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, the bestsellers at the time. You have the bestsellers. Yeah, um, okay, so Stephen King's Little Rose Claiborne, which I actually bought new. So this is when I'm actually starting to buy Yeah, books. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, like. Yeah. Um, and then, um, which was, by the way, a fantastic book that I did not understand as a fantastic book as a young person. Right. Because that's Stephen King trying to learn how to write grown-up women. Mm. And, like, you know, I thought it was, like, kind of weird and boring. This was, like, his year of woman, because, like, also Gerald's Game was yeah. the other one. Oh, and, yeah, I did absolutely get that from the library, and somebody at church it's tried too- to tell my mother what it was about, and I lied. It's too, it was too claustrophobic for me. Like, it makes, it's like that reverse claustrophobia thing. Yeah. I don't know. It just, okay. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, it was also about dirty stuff, though. Yeah. So, so much yeah. Dirty that was an stuff. issue. Um, Pelican Brief by John Grisham. Oh. Also on all your Mima's uh, um, yeah. bookshelves for at least 20 years after this. Um, Jewels by Daniel Steele, because there's always going to be a Daniel Steele book. Ever. And Scarlet. Oh, God, Scarlet. I will confess now, say what you will, I was crazy into Gone with the Wind as a kid. I, I was a young woman who was super bookish growing up. Were you team Melanie at least? Like, Melanie is the best. I did not understand that until much later. Yeah. I mean, Scarlet's, like, interesting and, like, where's the red and stuff. And, like, and not to, like, completely deviate, but what really does kind of, I find upsetting is that Melanie in the book is awesome. Yeah. Melanie on in the movie is, she like. She gets a few moments of awesome, but she does. Or, like, remember, like, Scarlet basically, like, catches on fire and, like, she whacks okay. her with the thing. Well, I mean, she's the one who's, like, oh, all right, so we got a dead fucking Yankee we here. Gotta what do we got to do yeah, about she's it? So yeah. Good. But yeah. yeah, she's great. I mean, but okay. So the thing is, yeah. as a as a kid, I did not understand the issues with the racial politics of this book. Yeah. All I understood was that the characters are amazing. The character yeah. Scarlett jo- jo- Scar Johansson, ah. fuck her, <laughs> Scarlett. The character of Scarlett O'Hara is this amazing character. Yeah, it's it's this. This book is like fucking crack. When you're fifteen, like that shit is like 15, if, yeah. If you grow up, especially in the South, yeah. in a lost cause narrative South, yeah. the book is fucking crack to you. Okay, I had read my copy several times, yeah. and then the sequel was coming out, and I was too young to understand what it means when a sequel comes out to a book that's a classic, okay? Yeah. The run far, far, far away. So I was so excited about it. My parents got it for me for Christmas. I unwrapped it on Christmas morning. I flipped my fucking shit. I was so excited. And then it turned out there was, like, a printing error where, like, many of the pages were unreadable, and uh. I was because you can't exchange a book on Christmas Day. Yeah. No, I get it. Yeah, and then I, the weird thing is I remember things about that book that I shouldn't because I only read it the one time. Maybe like, we'll read that one sometime, too. Oh, God. Oh, we should. Oh, my God. There's, like, these uh, striped stockings that she buys. That yeah. She's puts wearing corsets. There's this whole thing where she, like, hides out in a treehouse. Uh, don't yeah. fucking ask. Yes, of course she gets back together with Rhett because it's bullshit and sucks. Yeah. Anyway, that was also a bestseller this time yeah. period, which I think is somewhat illuminating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are right, you ready? Yes. And buckle it up. 1992 is the year we're talking about. I think yeah, we yes. Got, like, I'm super sure we've excited. Said that. And, like, we're like, meh. But yeah. 
Okay. Huh. So, like, like, like it said on the back cover, Sam, uh, her father has died. She's been nursing him. Before that, she was essentially fucking nursing her shit heel of a husband who yes. just divorced and her. and beat her. Santa Fe. Santa Fe. Yeah. Yeah, her father's in Louisville. Her husband was in Santa Fe. It matters and it doesn't matter. It's crazy. Right, right. And she gets one of those um, those wills, those soap opera romance novels. Yes. Like, I don't know, comedy wills, where she, there's a, uh, she can get all the money if she can do blank. And the blank is, you have to move to New York for at least a year and find out what happened to your grandmother. In this fabulously appointed apartment. This Which brick is what paid for. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. So she get okay. So she gets to New York. She has the worst time. Like she has the typical never been in, never been to the city. Like she gets her wallet stolen. Wallet stolen. Has a terrible cab. Like all that stuff. So well, she, it is a little bit racist, by the way, in the cab. So she pulls up. She pulls up and like she's walking to you know. And she's real like just frowsy. Like she's always got her hair like pulled up. She's always in like she's waiting for her reveal. Yeah, there's yeah. like Peter Pan collar. Just you know, Laura Ashley from the neck up. She is just covered, or from the neck down covered. So she's walking, and all of a sudden, this is the second dude in hot ass cutoffs. A guy like the hottest <laughs> man she's ever George. seen it's in George, shorts, shorts, like catches a football in front of her. They look at each other for about five seconds, and then it's like, move. No, I, like, when you say moves, though, I say sexual assault. She was in for it. But she, no. she was totally she was there for it. She was very surprised. She was putting her hands into his, Eventually, like, sweatshirt. Yeah, well, no. after he, like, put his mouth on her mouth, and then he takes her ankle. Luckily, she's yeah. an ex-gymnast. Oh, and, uh, and puts her ankle at the small yeah. of his back. They were, if you did that to me, do you know what happened? Oh, my God, you'd be cracking. Thump. Your leg would be like, ah. So, but, so they make out for like a hot five minutes. And then Sam's like, nah. You know, she remembers where well, she is. Appropriately. So she finds out that the hottest man she's ever seen in the cutoff shorts is her new landlord slash guardian. Yeah, she finds out it's like a Britney Spears situation. That's her guardian who decides when she's done with her quest. Yeah, there's a quest. Yeah. So at first she doesn't want to go in. He finally like talks her into the house. But he can't figure out why she's so mad. And I mean, frankly, fuck him. And you know what? Like, we can't get bogged down. And, like, there's so much of this plot. Like, we cannot get bogged down. Really in patient. The, I know, I know, in, I know, in, I know. In so she she goes in. She finds out that Mike, that's his name, Michael Taggart, um, like, he stays in the bottom half of the apartment. And there's a room, like, a little ensuite. En suite. Uh, Upstairs for her. But so not she, entirely, because they had to share a kitchen. So she right. can't just close the doors. But she just goes up there and, like, shuts herself off for, like, a month. And this was, um, it was decorated by her father. He had always planned on going there and, yeah. and doing this himself. Finding yeah. out what happened to his mother. And then he got cancer and he couldn't do it. Right. So it's very Again. masculinely decorated. So this, this plays in later. Yeah, this comes, the quest. The quest will come in later. But, yes, it's, it's very much that 1980s, 1990s, like, Soap opera man. Everything's yeah. Hunter Green yes. and dark. And there's, and there's ducks. ducks. Jinx. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've been in so many of these rooms. Though, oh, my you? God. So many ducks. So oh. she basically goes in there and just sleeps for like a month. The weird thing is that for women, ducks go in the kitchen. For men, ducks go in the study yeah. in the 90s. What's up with that? And she, like, she basically figures out like that New York has been like grub hubbing since the 90s. Yeah. And she's like, I can order everything. So She's been afraid to even leave her block. Yeah. The, I mean, she doesn't have a cell phone and shit, so I get She it, reminds you know. me a lot of Dawn from the Babysitter Club mm. Super Special, where they go to New York City, and Dawn is terrified to leave the apartment. There you go. One day we're going to have to do one of those. Oh it's going to be so great. That one, because I can do it from memory. Oh, yeah. um. <laughs> <laughs> well, and okay, so this does make a lot of emotional sense, because this is somebody who has been caretaking. Yes. For, I mean, essentially she's been, like, wiping her husband's ass for however, figuratively. And, and before that, it was her father, like... Yeah, she was literally wiping her father's ass. Like a preteen. Ass. Oh, well, yeah, because her mother died when she was 12. The, so she took care of her father, then took yeah. care of her husband, and then when they got divorced, came back to take care of her father, and then her father died. Yeah. So you know what that's like when now suddenly you don't have any responsibilities. Right. You don't know what to do with yourself, and the grief sets in, and then what do you do? She sleeps. Courtney would just be out, like... Drinking and partying. Well, I mean, because she doesn't have anywhere to go, that's the thing. She doesn't have a job. Fair enough. It's not good for her. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. So, finally, Mike. Michael gets sick of this shit. And I feel like, okay. Well, a stripper has to tell him that's not healthy. <laughs> but I feel like if you, a callback to when we discussed um, Ghost of a Chance. 
And we talked about daddy characters. Mm Mm-hmm. I feel like Michael Taggart is very much a daddy character. Yeah. So he finally, like, takes his key that he didn't tell her that he had. He lied about. That's different from not telling her. So he straight up, like, goes into the apartment and he's like, get your ass up. Like, are you trying to kill yourself? And, you know, she's like, how dare you? Unhand me. Reasonably. She's always saying, release me. I was like, who says the word release, though? Well, she has to a lot because he needs to be told that. It's a weird verb for it. Release? Like... It's because Wilson Phillips is still a banger. Oh, shit, yes. Yes. <laughs> so. Hold on for one more day. Um, that is right then, isn't it? Well, they had one that was Release Me, wasn't it? Yes, it is. Release yeah. Release Don't give me some. Okay. <laughs> All right. Focus. Okay, so. Focus. M- Michael is like, hey, girl, this is dumb. Like, my plan is that you help me with this project. I've got to find out about this gangster. And we think that your grandmother was tied into it. You help me with this, and I'll release I'll I'll release you from this stupid guardianship thing. He's writing a book. Yeah, and he's like, but first of all, we got to get you squared away, looks wise. Yeah, and so this this was really funny, and this is what Jude Devereaux does again. Like I said, glitter in one hand, wish fulfillment. So he's like, we're going shopping, and she's like. F you. And, like, basically she puts on a Garanimal. No, he doesn't tell her that they're going shopping. He says, we're going to go see the sites. We're going to go, yeah. like, the Statue of Liberty. And, and I, I do like that she's like, fuck you. She so, puts yeah. on a Garanimal. Like, like, an old, like, like a pink sweat suit. With, like, a kitten on it. Yeah. And, like. Because she's like, fuck you. I'm not, I don't want to be seen with you. Therefore, I'm going to make you embarrassed to be seen with me. So, and, it, but, and he's not embarrassed. He's just yeah, like, he whatever. But, he's you know, like, he's, he's so handsome that he doesn't ever get embarrassed. Like, he's that no. guy. Yeah. So, He's like, surprise, I'm taking you to Saks Fifth Avenue where my cousin is a personal shopper. And she's like, what? She's so embarrassed. But just uh, hilariously, she thinks everybody in New York is looking at her. Yeah. Have you ever been to New York City? Oh, my God. There's, like, so many old ladies with those shopping bags, like, basically in that outfit. Yeah, but, okay, so nobody in New York City looks at anything. They consider it, like, a port of fucking pride. Yeah, so. You the, can take a shit right now in the library <laughs> and nobody in New York City they will go look at in, you. They go to Saks. She meets his cousin because, again, the, the, the Taggart and the Montgomery families are, like, all Jude Wright. So, there's a bazillion of them. And we're supposed to remember their names, but I didn't so no. fuck it. All right. So, they go, to, they go to Saks, and he's, like, he basically rigs it to where she thinks she's getting super insider deals, it's and she's so dumb. really elaborate, though, because what they have her do is she, they have her open up a store credit card, and they tell her that she's sort of under the table getting yes. his cousin's store a discount, and she, even my, though she has not lived, she has, she's not from fucking buttfuck nowhere, all right? She well, lived in Louisville and Santa Fe. What I found really interesting is there's a part where, like, the personal shopper asked Mike, she's like, because he's like, ah, whatever, spend whatever, and she's like, I remember she's like, are you talking Chloe or are you talking Liz Claiborne? And yeah. I was like, man, why are you, why, right. why are you throwing Liz Claiborne well, under the bus? Well, she's throwing her under the bus. She's just saying that there's price points. I know, but and you know what I'm saying. So, like, I can do an amazing Liz Claiborne shop fest for you, and that would be different from really? the one that we would do if I were doing, like, you know, I don't know, it just brought me back to, like, when in middle school everybody had the Liz Claiborne purses, that little oh, triangle, oh, yeah. the, the leather triangle. I forgot about that. So she has a big shopping never, spree. Course, she got her hair cut. It's the whole thing. It's, it's the, um, She got the cute bob. It's like, like she the got, one underwear. She got a sassy bob. Well, but she's got curly hair, so she's got kind of, like, the curl bob. Yeah. Yeah. And she started um, doing makeup, and the makeup alone is like five hundred and ninety yeah, bucks. Yeah, like I mean, he know? he basically for this shopping spree probably spends thirty thousand dollars. Probably at least, at least, because it's all these suits, these Italian cut like suits. yeah, they're, not, they're off the rack. It, this is pret a porter. Yeah, we are not talking about couture it here. Killed me, but, but like, yes. but like, there's so much of it. And he's buying her like five hundred dollar underwear sets. So again, thirty grand for everything. He's picking out her underwear too, which is weird and controlling. But next, he's got a white thing that comes into play later. Yeah, he all, like, like you can wear anything, and that's fine. But if you wear something like a, I found the white, white, I found the white thing sort of hot. But yeah, yeah. we'll get to that. Sure. Okay, so they go shopping. He, this is the early days of computers, so he has a computer, and like she's a computer. It's in a box. He hasn't opened it, and she's like, "I love computers." So she opens the computer, and like that he's, was like her fake job. 
He pretends to like be her dumb lady at job. it. Yeah. It's, 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 it's the, the, the thing is though, all these I things didn't find are supposed it just, to be cute. Are the kind I, of things that drive me crazy? I didn't find it to be a lady job. I felt like she knows a lot about no, computers. No, no, no. She does. It's just that that was like the job that was acceptable for her to do. Yeah. When she was married. I'm not saying that it was, like, a fake yeah. job. I'm saying that that's the job that, um... I don't know, but, I mean, I get, we'll get into this later. But, so, she... Okay, so Mike is giving her snippets of information, and he's talking about her grandmother, who may or may not have been part of, like, related to, like, banging a mob guy. And so, she saw this woman that's been dead her whole life. Yeah, and so she also finds out that... At this time, she thinks that her grandfather is this nice, elderly, old man. Cal. Cal, who was in the mob, but, you know. No, no, no. Cal was not. Cal had no. nothing to do with it. Right. But, like, okay. Cal's so, in Louisville. Yeah. But then she finds out that her that her grandmother, Maxie, was, had been previously related, or, like, previously in a relationship with this mobster. Doc. Doc. So, she's like. A grandfather. You know, they go to visit him. Mm-hmm. Um, because, and that, Michael's excited because he's writing this book about Doc, and he's like, you're the only way I'm going to get in. He's very reclusive. Yeah. I'll never see him if you don't ask us. And they go to see him. And But he, Michael doesn't tell her very much about this guy, and she's primed because she's thinking, she's been told that maybe this is her actual grandfather. Yeah. I feel like Michael was supposed to be, there's an author that my husband fucking loves hold on um uh, that is like a crime writer like he writes all about all these like yeah it'll come to me later um so he writes about like the irish mob he writes about you know like the cuban mafia that kind of stuff christopher will like hear me talking about it be like rah, 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 you know scream it from another mm-hmm. room well you'll so, hear it if he does i feel like this is like who he's supposed to be you're not really told that but you feel like he's like I don't think it's ever proven he's novelist. ever successfully written a book before. He's just fucking rich. Yeah. Well, he is He is, He is. is rich. So, TJ English. I feel like he's like the TJ English of the 90s. So, <laughs> and I'm going to say, like, if TJ English wanted to, like, put me under guardianship and we have, like, some kind of crazy sex romp where we, like... It's really hot. I don't know, but I mean, like, he's written a lot of books and, like, he's got, he's got BD... E that's like I haven't even read the books and I'm like already there for it. <laughs> wow, so, like, like, that must be just coming out of the. I mean, he's got great book names like the Pat, woodwork as it were. Patty whacked. That's a dope okay. baller like All Boston right. mob. Fair, fair, mm. fair. So there's another Patty whacked by T.J. English. Read it. So anyway, they meet Doc, and it's like this very strange scene oh where my God. he she's yeah. not concerned enough, but it's clear that this guy is kind of on the skids. Like there's where they've sold off paintings, like that kind of thing. It's like this, and he's like state. trying to. He's like the I'm an old man. I did what I had to do. Oh, yeah, and he's in a wheelchair, so he seems harmless, mm-hmm. and you know, like. And Michael did not fucking brief her. No, like, hey man, he's a murderer. So. Sorry, we have some dog issues here. Dog it's issues. Fine. It's fine. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. So they meet the guy, and then she like it's like oh, ready to move in with him, right? And then they move out. They go because home. she's she's ready to like pack it in and take care of another useless dying man. That's a good point. I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah, she's ready because that's what she knows how to do. Right. So they go back home. And they kind of, like, start on with, like, the things that they do in life. And, and she actually goes on a date with one of his cousins, Rain Montgomery. And, and, and Michael, like, t- like s- he stalks them. So, like, because he sees that they're followed. So, Rain is everything that Michael, they're opposite. So, the Montgomerys are the super bougie, like, Kitty Bunkport members of the family. The Taggers yeah. are, like, the down and out, rough and ready Coloradoans. And so Rain actually asks her on a date and is like polite. Yeah, and imagine like, that. Didn't just like assault her in the street. Buys her a balloon and ice cream and shit. So don't buy me a balloon. Yeah, don't buy me a balloon. But it's the nineties. Yeah, um, whatever. They hadn't invented what. I don't yeah, know. we didn't know how terrible. Well, I mean, we knew, but anyway. So, <laughs> so Michael fall. Yeah, Michael tails her. He gets assaulted. Gets like closed head drama and like yeah. just skulks off. Yeah, and then but she, she comes, like busts him and thinks that he was following her, of course, because she's on a date. She's a little bitch about it. So she goes home and like he's got a concussion, and so like you know, layers are and coming. stitches, stitches. Yeah, he's so rich that just doctors come to the house. No, well that's his cousin also. Mm-hmm. So many fucking cousins. <laughs> so she like is starting to like peel the onion layers a little bit, like. Oh. 
you're okay. But like they, they end up like snuggling. There's a hard snuggle. Yeah, happening. there's a hard snuggle. Uh, so in this case, in other words, there's some danger that you're starting to feel. But the thing yes. is, like, she wakes up in the middle of the night. Somebody in her room who who starts choking this is her. A, yeah, this is like we don't know how much later. He had he had healed. Yeah, from... and it's weird because the time in this is weirdly yes. stretchy and stuff. But yeah, somebody is. On top of her, strangling her and screaming, where's Half Hand's money? And so, like, she has the presence has no of mind to, like, idea. beat against the wall to get his attention, like, Michael's attention. And he busts through the door. Uh, and Michael, yeah. Literally. Like, and so, the guy, like, scales out the window. Her throat and neck are so injured that she can't really talk. For days. Which yeah. is good for him, I guess, because... But there's, like, there's an interesting thing that happens. Like, he has a cookout with friends over, and, like, she's just not used to people. Mm-hmm. Like, so, like, the cookout with even, like, just normal people, she's, like... And it's also tough She's for trying her. to, like, feed people. And, like, she's trying to be the hostess. And he's, like, just sit down. Yeah. Have a good time. And a lot of his friends are... I'm not sure if it's because of his research or just because his friends tend to be um, women who work as strippers. Yeah. And it was kind of a test for her. Like, are you going to be a cunt or not? Yeah. And, of course, she wasn't. Because well, like, at first, you know, I think it took her a little aback. Like, people's yeah. jobs and stuff. But then, like, it totally... It's a weird book, and we'll get into this yeah. later, like, that there's, like, there's a lot of, like, white lady progressiveness happening. Yes. <laughs> yes, so, exactly. Um, yes. But, well, yeah, I'm so. informed I can't say woke anymore, so I guess this is the, the new woke, is this? Well, I think it's, like, the, the thing, Karen woke. I think the thing is, is, like, woke is a, generally now it's considered, like, performative, like, just to be a thing. Well, I mean, you, yeah, can, I mean, you, I you be less. Sarah, and you use the word you want to use, but, like. Well, I think that what we should do, we talked about this, is we should retake the word social justice warrior. <laughs> yes, so... Because why was that... Why did we ever let them steal that from us? Or even make that as a pejorative? Yeah. Everybody should want to be a social justice warrior. Exactly. If you're not a social justice warrior, what are you doing with your time? Yeah. All right. Focus. Anyway, focus. We're never going to get... Riding the ship. Riding the ship. Okay. Oh, the shipper boat. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm riding the ship. The... Courtney is Courtney's playing with fire here. So, yes, uh, now Michael, like, it starts to, he's not a bright guy, I honestly, you know, he's a hot I dude. I kind of like Michael. He's a power lifter, which is weird that keeps coming up. Like, it's constantly it's coming up. The 90s. Um, but, um, so, he finally figures out, he tweets the He is the smart, idea. though. No, he is smart. Remember, he's like a mathematical genius. Well, he's not a genius at figuring out all the people who are stalking you and hurting you and doing crimes to you might be related <laughs> to the criminal you just had lunch with. Oh, hello. So he's not that fucking smart, okay? He's not the kind of smart. That you I feel can like use he knew it, and he was just life. sort of like, "Hey, we're gonna see what happens." All right. Uh, yeah. Continue. Well, anyway, so he finally comes a little bit cleaner with her. Yeah, he's like, "Hey, bitch!" Like, Doc is called that because they used to call him the surgeon. Because when he was like, I don't know, three years old, he just like plopped down a heart in front of somebody when told. To, I mean, and it's like, like, by that. the way, he's not really your grandpa. There's another guy. There's another guy that like. I'm related to, but that doesn't matter. Well, they didn't know. They didn't know that time that it wasn't yeah. necessarily done. Oh so, There's this other dude whose name is Michael Ransom. That's another dude. Who's named after. But, um, so Mike was named after this guy, but he's not actually related to him, who in this club shootout, this not, the Schmalentine's Day Massacre. The Schmalentine's Day Massacre. Michael Ransom is basically shot in half. Yeah. But, like, good doctors and the Taggarts are rich. They just, yeah. bloop, 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 sew him up, and he's yeah. fine. So he, but he was in a wheelchair all of, yeah. um, Michael's life, and yeah. he told him all these stories. Michael yes. finally comes a lot cleaner, although not entirely shot. fucking clean. About this, and is like, okay, you want to be partners in this investigation thing. Yeah. And she, for her part, actually looks in the goddamn hat box she was given. Yeah, there was like, yeah, her father had given her, like, of the things that she could have now. Yeah. There was, like, a hat box, and I'm like, holy shit, here's a bunch of fucking clues and some granny panties. Yeah, it is the entire outfit that Maxie, her grandmother, wore that night in 1928. And I mean the entire outfit, including the blood splatter, by the way, on the dress. Blood but splatter. But it comes with the underpants, the under business. Oh my gosh. And then there's a part where she's like, hey, I'm going to put this stuff on and, like, slick my hair back. And that's how skinny she is. Wait, but also, like, you don't put literal granny panties on. I'm not putting on any used underwear. Like, from the 1920s, I don't care. No, it's not happening. We don't swap underpants. My mama taught me better than no, that. You no, just, you never swap underpants. No, you just don't. So oh, we she, put, she puts it on, and it's at this moment that it reveals that all of a sudden she sings, like... Barf. 
she sings like someone who has been systematically, you know. She's the new Bessie Smith. Oh, God. It's upsetting. So she comes out and sings like an old Bessie Smith song. And Michael's like shaken because she doesn't look like herself. Well, and that actually does make sense for her personality. That she takes any opportunity to dress up as an opportunity to not be herself. Yeah. So she's like being yeah. So maxi. she's yeah. She's singing like the song of like disenfranchised people, um, and we we should say that at some point I'm not sure where we know this, but it is important for future plot. When her mother died, she has always felt responsible because and okay, I guess she was a dim child too because what happened was she really wanted to go to somebody's birthday. There was kind of a lie involved about what's going yeah. on the birthday, whatever. She was twelve. And as she re- she threw a fit. She was being a twelve year old kid. But she, uh, her mom, like she's like, you had to pick me up and take me to this birthday party. Yeah. And her mom, according to her, was rushing so hard that she fell against a radiator, burned herself, and then ran in front of a truck. Now, did this freak anybody else? Is like that doesn't seem entirely like a thing it's that would ever happen. Thing. Yeah. So, but she's always felt like it was her fault. Yeah. So she's got again. She's got a lot of like guilt, and she's got a lot of self loathing, and she's just got. A lot going on, which we'll get into. Yeah, so then they sort of really investigate this fucking 1928 thing. And what you have to remember throughout all this, which was a constant surprise to me, is that I remember 1992 really well, and so do you. Yeah. But if you were an adult in 1992, there were tons of people from 1928 still around. My house was built in 1928, and it feels like a fucking crypt shack sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is crazy to yeah. think about, like... This is a generation, in the, like, it's a time machine generation thing. Yeah. We're a whole generation back, and therefore there'd be tons of people who actually remember yeah. this, meaning this is still dangerous. Yeah. So, I mean, like, now if we were to investigate 19 crimes from 1928, we would not be worried at all that somebody would really try yeah. to, like, do something and, like, kill us for it, because all these people are dead. Yeah, I mean, it is, yeah, it's like, it does crack me up, it's like 60 plus years, and I was like, hey. But, um... Anyway, so yes. But so, what, you, what you learn that's important is that there are several million dollars at stake. That's half hands money. Millions. 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 This fucking house that Michael owns is more th- by far more money than than the half hands money. I by mean, the way. like again, he's living in like a brownstone walk up. He's got the whole fucking building, and I'm guessing it's the Upper East Side, like. It's Lexington Avenue. I don't know where that is. Oh, shit. Yeah. Like, his building is... Yeah. Like... Yeah. Like, don't even bother. Just He like, shits $3 million dollars mm-hmm. in the morning after his coffee. It's ridiculous. Okay. So, where are we? So, where- uh, I should explain some of the backstory that we learned at some point is that there's these millions of dollars because what happened in this massacre is that Halfand, Doc's lieutenant... His name was really Joe. See, where do they remember that? I don't remember anything else. Um, he had stolen millions of dollars from all the other right. everything. I forget who was stolen. It doesn't matter. And then whoever it else was came and shot them all up. There's a lot of plot happening. Oh, my God. So much plot. So that there is money that has always been rumored to have been hidden. Nobody knows where it is. Yeah. And, again, I feel like, yeah, I don't know how many millions we're talking about, but, like, Michael is worth way more than the millions that we're talking oh, about. Oh, like, yeah, absolutely more than these millions. So they start capering. There's capering happening. And there's, there's things. Michael goes and meets a woman that he suspects to be Maxie. But she doesn't tell her granddaughter that. Abby. It's Abby. Abby. So, and it's like really sad nursing home, which having been there. Um, well, no, this is a rich, sad nursing home. But, I've been so, to the other. Um, so she brings, Michael brings Sam to the nursing home. And pretty much is like, hey, I think this is probably your grandmother. She's lying. No, but, no, no. He doesn't fucking tell her. Yeah. But, but, she like, has to figure it out on her own. I feel like everybody knows. If we all know. <sighs> anyway, so she goes to the, the nursing home. She meets Abby. Then, like, the next day she goes again. She makes some sidecars. Like, Abby. they're talking about the good old days. Abby Abby's gets drunk in, and is like, me. And so she's like, this is my. Abby is in bad shape, though. Abby yeah. is not going to last a couple more months. Yeah. So she starts bonding with this woman that is obviously her grandmother. Um, the grandmother has never really come out and said, you know, hey, not yet. They kind of go sideways at it. Yeah, it, I mean, it's cute, fine. All the while, all the while, all the while, this is happening, and oh there's, like, God. a bazillion points of plot. Ha- like, I feel like it's, like, a whole year of Days of Our Lives condensed into one book. <laughs> the interesting thing that is happening, and we'll get more into this when we do questions, is Sam is becoming more and more receptive 
Oh, I didn't even think about that. I thought we were going to talk about the blues. No. Like, <laughs> Santa's becoming more and more receptive to, like, Michael and also just relationships in general. It's not just her relationship with him, but, like, making friends, having female friends, stuff like that. Like, there's a lot of interesting... Like yeah. I said, you got you got Jude Devereaux who puts feminism in one hand and shit in the other and smacks it together. So there's a lot of really cool things to me happening in this book that I think are important. I feel that what she is trying to do is to make something for women specifically. And what 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 her thesis is maybe, and I'm putting this words into Drew Deborah's mouth, is that what women say is not necessarily what they actually I don't know, but like what? I, which is why he lies and all. But see, I feel like we'll get into this later but like i feel like her a really good touch for how people interact i feel like her tone really understands a woman that's like been neglected or feels like she's been neglected or has been overlooked because there's a whole other part in the book that's like kind of a throwaway where sam goes out like dawn in the Babysitter Club <laughs> Super Special. She goes out by herself and it's this huge victory and like she shops and like she barters and she brings this little like sumo a gift like, for a him, little, which like, is a big deal. Yeah, a little samurai warrior for him. And to her, like what was more important and the thing that Sam talked about was like him actually listening yeah. to, about her day. He was excited that she, it was about the thought. Like, well, no, the it's like the gift, but then like her then showing also, him the other stuff and him not just being like, like. And I went and they were like this and it was. And, and it was wasn't excited. like, yeah, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. that's whatever. Like it, he, like he actually was engaged in her conversation. I tell you, a Jude Devereaux man will make you feel special. Yes. And, but I feel like there's, there's two parts of it. And again, we'll get into this later, but like there's the, the amped up like bazillionaire part of it but then like it's the little real world like listening to somebody i really wish that this book okay well i would not want this book to be different than it was oh it's but so good for, but for this book to be rewritten by her yeah as just like two people who live in the same yes. street yeah exactly like and nobody's a millionaire and nobody shot anybody in 1928 yeah. and nobody owns a speakeasy Ugh. Okay. It's just, yeah. So, and in among all of this, they find out that the man, Jubilee, who owned the, he didn't own the club. He was a piano player at the club. Yeah. Weirdly, he owns the club now. Doesn't make any sense. Anyway, so Jubilee, still alive. There's, like, uh, articles in the newspaper. They don't go to the fucking library like they need to. Yeah. Uh, anyway, if they had asked me, I could have found this shit for them so much faster. So, anyway, Jubilee's still around. The club's still around. It's been shuttered since 1928 yeah. in New York fucking city. That must be some real estate, huh? So she goes to see Jubilee, and he doesn't want to talk to her, because, well, you got to talk to this fucking cracker who walks in. I'm not going to talk to this white bitch. Like, they act like Harlem, by the way, is oh, on geez. the bottom of the sea on the other ass end of Atlantis. I have, again, I have a lot of issues, like, with what with what happens. I'm not to say that you don't We, we will talk about this later, yeah. of course, in our... Um, in our are, are racist but well. again I feel like this is very much like white lady talks about like like a white lady's you know source to being on the uh, and you know I, the more we talk about the fact that woke has become like a thing that you perform this is a woke book yeah, this is a like, woke in that book sense, this yes is this is a per- this is a performative you know piece on woke look I went to Harlem yeah have you been to Harlem because I've been to Harlem you know I've been to Harlem too you know what they call Harlem Columbia University well I mean like, okay maybe not I mean well the 90s Columbia University was still there but <laughs> you know but I mean like yeah like I mean Harlem still is a very real thing but you know I, I, it's just anyway okay anyway okay so she goes and she meets Jubilee who's very oblique um, and she also meets his nephew, Ornette, oh, God. who is a contemporary jazz musician. I want to. Uh, I would. I would throw a fuck into Ornette today. I'm, uh, Bev Jenkins. Bev Jenkins. If you're listening, you're not. But if you are, Bev Jenkins, we want you to write the book about Ornette because yes. Ornette is the hottest person in this. Don't book. let Jude write the book. No, about I mean Ornette. Jude's not going to, and you know. Whatever. There was a funny moment where like Ornette like has no fucking patience for this white woman who walks in and and she said she's just like belts out the blues and then she like hangs her neck out the fire stick it's like with that eye Ornette and then like there's an again we'll get into this oh, God there's so much that like I, I want to like so many things to say she she calls Ornette racist because Ornette is correct mm-hmm. supposition is that white people can't sing the blues. 
And her thing, her very white answer to this is that anyone who's been sad in life can sing the blues. That's why we fucking invented country music, bitch. Exactly. And it's like, you know, like, it's this idea that, like, being sad and being oppressed are the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what I found really bothersome about it was, like, again, like we said, this is the woke book of, like, oh... We should be appreciative that these characters, like, that we, and we'll get into this when we do our racings, like, we have characters of different color, but the, the same thing, like, that that should just be enough. And, like, oh, we can all come together because we can talk about the blues. Like, fuck, no, we can't. Like, you're talking about completely different things. Like, yeah, I've been sad. You've been sad. But you know what? I haven't been. I haven't been oppressed Generation after generation after generation. I'm not having to fight against a system that is against me. And we can both sing blues songs if we want to, but we should kind of defer to Ornette. And Jesus, the and like she's not. And, place, and like, there's know? another part where like Jubilee, who is a man that has lived through the Jim Crow era, he's in his he's 90s. Like, is like, oh, Ornette met his match, and I was like. Ornette ain't yet met his match. I was Although like, I was I was like, like are you serious? Like, you've, you've given him this little bit of like this like. Uncle Tom now. Ugh. Which I'm sure was just like, oh, y'all y'all are really rich. Can we, um... Yeah. Yeah, or, or I like to think that Ornette, uh, sorry, the Jubilee was getting all the money the Jubilee could fucking get. I just, yeah, so... And so was Ornette, because Ornette, you know what Ornette needs? is a fucking record deal. Oh my god. It was just like the whole idea of like, oh, I can sing the blues just as Fuck good yeah. as you can. You know because... who sings sad-ass songs without cultural appropriation? Sorry, pardon. Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton. Save us all, I'm waiting for my Christmas tree chopper. Um, anyway. And we'll it's get true, more, though. We have our own goddamn sad ass songs. We'll get more into it, but it's just, I uh, felt like it's like, here's this white bitch coming to Harlem. In her $1,000 suit, let's not forget. Her $1,000 suit and the the car, a, a hired car. Yes. They have a hired car and a bodyguard. Yeah, of course they and, do. And... She is telling this man who has lived poverty. Oh, you're about, a racist. Yeah. Oh, God. Fuck you, it just Sam. really irritated me. Anyway, Bev Jenkins, we'll talk about this Ornette thing. You don't have to give me a kickback. I would just appreciate, oh like, a, you let me know when it's coming to TV. Mm-hmm. You know, Bev Jenkins just got a TV deal. I know she did. I'm so excited. And it's going to be great. It's going to be so great. I mean, yeah. I'm not excited for her in the sense that, like, she should have always had one. I'm excited I that mean, she she's got had, this. like, a couple, but this is going to be Well, she had, like, yeah. a, um, a movie yeah, recently. Yeah, a movie, yeah. That, uh, yeah. Yeah, but well, this is a historical, though. Yeah. So, like, this could be, oh. like, the big budget African-American know, historical so that excited. we've always want. Oh, I'm, I'm, this better be good, y'all. Don't fuck it up. Don't it's fuck gonna it up. It's going to be great. So anyway, that's the divert. Focus. Focus. Get back on the train. Jesus. The right. train does not know where the train is going. Okay, so then they meet Jubilee and Ornette, and then they go see this, like, ratty dude in a bar, and she puts on this weird, like, hey, baby, like, costume and that. It's weird. I don't know. They next. finally fuck. They finally fuck, and it's hot. We'll get on that later. It's, it's, they finally fuck. I mean, they don't fuck until, like, page 300, so I do appreciate that. Um, I think... I know. I feel like... I'm trying to keep her from slapping the couch. I'm going to slap the couch. Like she wanted to slap Michael's ass. Yeah. I, well, well yeah. Just... I, I, I do appreciate that they didn't do it, like, right away. That was nice. But... No. And she was not healed by his dick, also, which oh I liked also. So, okay, they fuck, and then Michael makes mention to his family that he's in love. And, and it's on. 5,000 people descend Central in Central Park. Park. It's the only venue that could have held them. It's like it was like the Simon and Garfunkel car concert. Like it was that many fucking. Well, they people. call it a barbecue, but you and know, you know what? what? Damn barbecue with that. If yeah, over thirty five. That's a solid fucking joke that I just made. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of you, that's a lot of people. Yeah. So they show up to the barbecue, wherein oh, a weird twin switch happens. Sweet. Michael has a surprise twin named Kane, and Kane like grabs that Sam and she's like, release me. That's her her catchphrase. <laughs> and everybody's like, hey, me. hey, you passed the test. Like, that's, that's well, the... Fuck you. Fuck the fuck out that's of you. Two, two, two things. One, there's a twin test. Two, Kane's wife, who's now dead, 
didn't pass the twin test. So nobody's sad. Everybody's like, well, <laughs> there's a part where Michael's like, well, we figured that she died because she didn't pass the twin test and she wasn't his true love. I was like, so we sacrificed her to the twin gods. I was like, so Kane's life has inherently more value yes. than this amazing French yes. woman who just got grabbed at an airport and was like, hey, it's my, my boy. Fuck that. So. You know what? I bet it's maybe like in this book that instead of being dead, like Maxine, she's like, fuck this shit. Fuck it. I'm out. I'm, I'm done out. with these people. I'm out. I'm going to go and hang with the cool people somewhere so. else. I'm going to go to Malta or I'm going to go to, I don't know. What else is cool? I don't know why I said Malta. I like Malta, though. Yeah, Malta's um, pretty. So, um, I bang the couch again. But Kane, the twin brother, has two twin boys because... Twins fucking make twins. That's what well, fucking happens. I, they do sometimes run in the family. My okay. mother was very concerned. All right, here's the thing, though. I, one of my good friends, Maura. What's up, Mo? Maura. Maura. Maura Kelly is a twin. Mm-hmm. She married a twin. I mean, she didn't birth. She didn't whelp she a twin. She did not whelp a twin. In this book, if a twin puts his dick in anyone. Well, then they have twins. A litter. Yeah, like a just litter. twins happen. So Sam's all taking care of the twins from Kane's dead wife that didn't pass and, and the And then like multiply test. into like six kids. It's like I mean, fucking it's... gremlins. Like it's just like <laughs> twins. Every time you put your dick somewhere, a twin appears and then more twins appear. See, and my mother always, uh, okay, I, this may be like one of those crazy apocryphal health things that mothers do, but my mom always was afraid that she was going to have twins because twins skip a generation in her oh, family. Just, it's, it's like just the Twin, yeah, I, I've twins. always told people that I ate it. Oh my god, <laughs> which would be very on brand for me. You would eat it, then. Um, all right, let's get through this shit. Yeah, so, let's get through this. So god, they have this we have crazy so fucking barbecue. She takes a twin home, and the tone in this is weird because remember that somebody tried to kill her. Yeah, she doesn't care, but they were bringing these kids home, and then she wanted to like steal Kane's kids, and then she sold their Diet Cokes. Ditch. You do not steal. Like, let me tell you. Somebody Don't steal a five-year-old's Diet Coke. If you're stealing my Diet Coke. Well. I'll fucking They were you. three, I think. Yeah. And, no, and it's fine. She, like, she has to, like, climb up a lattice. Like, yeah. Uh, like, they, they are insane. Right. But she has a magical mother touch because, of course, she fucking does. Look what she's getting herself into is another goddamn caregiving job. Ha ha. By the way, she's throwing up. Anyway. So... All the while this is happening, she's hanging out with Maxie. There's this amazing bookstore scene that I wish we could just, we'll spend time on it later. It's awesome. We don't have time to do it in the plot. But, okay, this is an important plot thing. They go to see this lawyer that they could put onto, whatever. So they see this lawyer, and this lawyer turns out to be half hands grandson. And this man who is in his mid-50s and has a pot belly and a comb over has a tattoo on a, like, a total blackout tattoo uh, up to his wrist on the last two fingers of one of his hands. This is the stupidest fucking thing. Like, this book and is... he, he has, the nails are painted black, so you know he has to keep touching that shit up. I don't or understand why does. this book is so complicated. So <laughs> Because he heard about his grandfather, oh and God. it's a tribute. So when he was 16, he got drunk and went out and got tattooed. Now, but, all right, to be fair, because you're all like, who gets tattooed at 16? I hung around with some people in college. All right. These are my party friends. Let let me be clear. Are these just party fingers? Let me be clear. These were the friends that I partied with. I mean, I, I was in college when I met them. But, so there was one guy. Oh, God. We'll call him Ted. Who was hot as shit. Like, he was a sex idiot. He was so fucking hot but he was the stupidest he is to this day the stupidest person i've ever met all right he is oh i can tell you don't work in a public library honey i like (laughs) i can't believe i'm telling y'all this all right so ted is the stupidest but most attractive person i've ever met Uh, no all right okay so ted would occasionally at parties take his shirt off and we were all very appreciative but ted had on his chest i think it was on his chest it was on his chest or his arm he had a tattoo it was homemade of his cousin <laughs> like Brand- a stick and like you get the pen ink and it was his cousin brandon dressed up in some kind of like inappropriate possibly like mildly racist get up 
It was his cousin Brandon smoking a joint. I am imagining this, and everything I imagine is more amazing than the last thing I imagine. <laughs> so I'm I'm figuring his hand is just like two oven mitts. So Ted had this tattoo, and like I remember seeing it for the first time. I just looked over, and he's like, "You like that?" And I was like, "That's something." He's like, "That's that's Brandon." But, <laughs> He's smoking a joint, and, like, and, he, and he's dressed like a and blah, blah, blah. And there was one time, like, I just need y'all to understand how stupid he was. And, like, please un- please know that this was not my friend. I partied with him. <laughs> Me and my other, like, real friend, we're sitting there talking. And all of a sudden, Ed was like, hey, 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 y'all ever think about that movie Ants? You remember Ants? <laughs> yeah, I do remember Ants. I saw he's Ants like, what if that? Ants is real? What if that's how ants are? <laughs> we're like, we're like, I don't, I don't know how to react to this. So anyway, homemade tattoos. I know people who have gotten them. It's bananas. But it's let even, me explain. And underage. Have you ever seen somebody with a hand tattoo ten years later? Again, I've seen somebody. Hand tattoos do not age well. <laughs> I've se- I've seen somebody with their 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 cousin made up to be. You know, a representation. I'm just saying, smoking tattoos. a joint, so. Like. And so he goes when he was 16, so I assume it was not a legitimate tattoo. Do you think he gets touch-ups? I don't know, because again, like, theirs was, like, that one was still pretty dark. Like No, a hand like, tattoo, though. Uh, I want you to Google aged hand tattoos. Yeah. All those little mustaches your little fucking friends got? No, they don't do <laughs> fucking, uh, did you, do you know somebody with a mustache? Little finger thing. You do, don't you? No, but the mustache was incorporated in the branded tattoo. <laughs> All I'm saying is, I know this man's tattoo is a, an insanely blotchy blue thing, which is not as it's depicted in the book. Or he goes back every year or so and gets this very painful entire very finger. True. And then also... Maybe he just up. rubs it in, like, you remember when you used to write? Like, maybe he's left-handed and it just all gets on his hand. Um, yeah, maybe it's not really a tattoo. He's yeah, totally maybe like, just like he's a terrible story. writer. Oh, my God, that sounds, you know... That's even better. Like, wow. But, so, yes, this man with his hand hand tattoo and painted black fingernails. This is either going to be our greatest episode or our worst. Like. <laughs> anyway, he's a lawyer. He's a lawyer. And a real lawyer. And he's a criminal defense yeah. lawyer. But, I mean, like, still a real lawyer. <laughs> and um, he seems to be a good guy. Yeah. Right? And he got this as, like, a tribute to his grandfather, who we know got shot and died yeah. in the 1928 thing. Okay. So... That's completely, uh, slightly irrelevant. It's just an important detail to mention. Because he's like, oh, girl, look, my people are the worst of the fucking worst. Like, seriously, you name a date, I can tell you a horrible thing one of my fucking clients did on it because people are terrible. This is a nice guy, by the way. So, Michael says, completely, I don't think he, I mean, I seriously think that he was just like, Yeah, so Louisville, Kentucky in 1975 or whatever. In other words, he he said the day that her mother died, but he didn't know this. And this is not why they are there at all whatsoever. They are there to find more information yeah. about Maxie. It just happens. The guy's like, oh, yeah, oh, my God. So I had this client, and thank God he got convicted because he was a fucking monster, and he, he confessed to all these crimes. And in one crime that he confessed to... Is that, like, um, he was sent once by his mob boss because somebody might have known where some money was. So he abducted that person's, like, um, you know, daughter-in-law, tortured her by burning her on a radiator, and then when she wouldn't talk, just mowed her down with this truck. Yeah. And then nobody can understand why Sam runs out of the room and throws up. Well, actually, she doesn't throw up because of trauma. She throws up because she's pregnant with 8,000 twins. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. We got to bring this home before we get to questions. Jesus, but, and then we're not even to the best part yet. Okay. That was really important. It was important. So, all the while, all this is happening, they have decided they're going to confront Doc. So, the way that they're going to confront Doc. Oh, hold on. God. Let me get through it. Oh, Let me get through it. Okay. Because, like, this is going to end Three, up. Three, two, one, Go. They're gonna put on a show. The only way this makes sense is this is a family who this is their answer to everything. Yeah. Like, they're gonna throw millions 
of dollars into doing a show. Because it's so, the real club. They're going to take Jeeva Lee's club, which has been shuttered, yes. by the way, in New York City, just wasting fucking tax dollars it's for 70 years. In the 90s, plausible. All right. So, what they're going to do is they're going to they're going to revamp the club. We got a club revamp. We're getting we're getting makeover. Ma- club makeover. We're getting all the band back together. We're getting Jubilee, we're getting Ornette. We're getting all the strippers that we met earlier. Yes. Everyone that Michael Taggart knows is now in the show. The Montgomerys and the Taggarts. They're all there. We're going to put on a show. Millions. Millions of do- millions of Insane. dollars, and also building like the GDP of a very small country goes into this medium size, and also I like the club was uninhabitable before, so yeah. you know that the building inspectors does not fucking know about yeah. this. That's yeah. another crime. So, but they gotta get Doc. Okay. So they, they're, they're going to put on the show, and then some fucking kidnapping happens. Okay, so first, okay, Michael understands that this, they could just ask people and get the actual answer at this point. They have enough threads unravel. But Jesus. he is afraid that eventually Sam will just, like, fucking kill herself yeah. when she's 50 for reasons I have yet to understand yeah. in the text. Oh, my God. So we must cathartic this. We must cathartize She's it. She's never cried. She's never cried. We just gotta get the whole and thing And instead of, like, sending this bitch to therapy, we're putting on a show. So... Oh, my God. The night of the show happens, and then we have a flashback. In the book. No, 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 no. No, we haven't kidnapped anybody yet. Oh, we do have the we have the kidnapping. Jesus. No, this man is in his 90s, but he's an incredibly dangerous gangster. There's an entire crime caper about paying off the gate guards, and they go over the wall, yeah. and there's dogs, and this and that, and they get up the stairs, and it turns out, oh, yeah, I knew you paid it's off very the much guards. Like, it's very much like the Great Muppet oh Caper, but instead of the baseball diamond, they're taking an old mafia man. And who is fucking serious? He's not funny at all. He's no, a he's, murder man. He's terrible. So they kidnap his ass. They there's, have a special truck. There's a high speed chase, but like they've got rich enough people to pay off the cops. They're like because the cops are in it. Like yeah. the cops are completely on their trail. They're like, oh, we had a medical emergency. Yes. A ninety year old man. We kidnapped. Oh my god, I cannot. I'm, I know that you're thinking of oh, the book and I. No, the book is. All of these things happen. All right, so. They, it's minor. It's not even a big deal. They drag the old ass man that they it just broke me. They focus. They drag the old ass man yes. that they just kidnapped. Yes. To Jubilees, yes. the club. Yes. Where we're we, we, in costume. We expect a goddamn show. Like I'm, yes. I'm waiting for like this. Oh yeah, this is gonna be amazing. I, I am waiting for the this 2019 cats to happen. Yes. Like that's what I am expecting. Every stripper Michael's ever met is in costume. They are oh ready to go out. I mean, and we are talking all the way down. There's a guy playing Michael Ransom. Sam. He's dancing. It is. Sam the, got the underwear clean. Like and the, she got a bit of the blood out of the dress. I yeah. Guess. Like, and then we just flash back to what happened. But it's not the whole thing. No. Like, it's just like, Oh, this happened. Michael Ransom got shot. It's in a different font. Fuck oh. you. Fuck the fuck out of you. So what happened was the baby was never, uh, well, okay, and we did know this, that it was not Doc's because Doc would not fuck her for, I guess, whatever messed up reasons of his, and it's yeah. really because, it, like, so that she doesn't have any, like, criminal blood in her or whatever. So it was always that she was in love with Michael Ransom, they were gonna run away together, and it turns out Half Hand Joe got shot by Doc and gave her the envelope full of Mark Cash, but also diamonds, and she diamonds. took care of uh, his son and then his grandson with the fucking... Uh, 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 fuck it, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't, doesn't matter. fucking matter. What does matter is, like, after this happens, shortly after, we don't know what the fuck happens to Doc. Doc, I think, just... No, did... he commits suicide, but you don't know what happened. How did, how did this don't... all man commit suicide? Like, how did he do it? Like, was it, like, hanging? No, I mean, you don't know what he does during the yeah. thing. You don't know what his feelings are. You yeah. know nothing about... The... What the? What? You give me so, a show. You you put on a show, but you did not give me the show. The show happened on stage. You know what this? How was that? The thing. You know what happen? this show was for me. What this show was the, the Russell we met on the way. This show was the Russell Crowe version of Stars. <laughs> it was completely disappointing <laughs> and lackluster. Uh, okay. So too many close ups. Not enough. So many close ups. Yeah. Not enough. Like, do you, you want to, like... You know, what's really funny is that um, my husband and I went to 
see Les Mis uh, when it came out because I really wanted to. Oh, my God. I have the same story. And I bet it's the same disappointing thing. Well, okay. Well, so, and we got to, like, the theater. And he looks around. He's like, is this Theater Geek Star Wars? Yes, baby. Yes, this is Theater Geek Star Wars. And, and, okay, so the first, like, 40 minutes, I was like, But then it was like, okay, so that same, like, get in on Fontaine's face we're just going to do for the rest of the movie? My big, and, again, we'll move on. This is a, no, this is okay. I think okay. that our audience is completely down with Les Mis. My big, um, my big complaint, like my, because again, Les Mis is my, like, mm, that's my jam. Oh my God. That's my, that is my all-time favorite thing. My husband got me tickets for the, like, after the disappointment that was, for me, the Les Mis movie, he got me, like, tickets for the show that was here in Columbia, and it was amazing, because we, like, we had amazing seats, and, like, Javert was looking at me, and I was like, Aww. yes! So, here's, here was my critique of it, Go. is that you take, you created this larger-than-life production, like, you're moving, you're moving a ship. Mm-hmm. You're moving a ship with men. Yes. And... By recording, so you've got this giant thing happening on screen, mm. and by recording it live, the the sound doesn't equate to what is happening. So that, for me, was the thing, like, I appreciate, like, if you want to do this live recording thing, like, something like Once, or there's, like, other shows that are quieter that lend itself to that. Like, if you want to do, because, you know, that was their whole thing, is, like, we're recording it as we go and I think there are shows that could lend it themselves like be really great that way but you've got again men hauling fucking ships out of the sea and it's and looking me- down and it's muted and it's muted and it's just like I felt like the tone didn't match what was happening well that- see that's really interesting because my issue with that movie was I guess in the opposite direction because, you know, I also was, like, completely yeah. there. I mean, do should we do... I, I wish we had rehearsed, like, a confrontation scene. <laughs> well, John, at last, we see each other playing. But, uh, so, in... So, I'm watching this movie, and I'm so yeah. there for it. And you get to Fontaine's death scene, and you are up in Hathaway's nostril, and it's I amazing. Yeah, I loved that, because I felt like that was the one moment... But they kept doing it. I felt like that was the one moment that it worked for The it. thing is, okay, so you're in a movie theater, and I mean, I don't know, maybe the intention was not for the movie theater, maybe it was at home, whatever, but when you do that, it's like that close-up, that you can't do that all the time. That's for, like, extreme emotion. Yeah. Uh, and it just felt like then, I, just, that, I, I was in everybody's nostrils. But I felt like because of the way that they recorded everything, like, it had to be this way, and again, a musical like Once, which is about like buskers and stuff like that, that would be awesome for mm-hmm. because it's very intimate. It's this very, but like doing an Android L- Lloyd Webber jam, like those are big. They're big things. And I just feel that the medium shot is unappreciated yeah. in filmmaking because yeah. you need it because you, you've you got to let the tension go. Right. You I cannot be up somebody's nose hair. It's all I fucking just movie. Was super, like, that movie also, was Also, like, we all forget it's a little bit like Bridge on the River Kwai. We all forget that half the fucking movie is Marius. It's not all Jean Valjean and Valjean. Valjean. Like, Uh. why is no one with like why like I was like Eponine girl forget Marius like in in Rojas is like anybody ever in Rojas is the best so all right. So the show. Oh, oh my God! They put yes, on the show. a show. That we it's don't. It's not Les Mis. It's nowhere near as good as Les Mis. We don't get to see the show. We just no. do this flashback. It's a blue balls show business. And somewhere, I would love to see dramatically uh, Doc doing whatever he does to kill himself because of what he sees in the show. And how do they even? They get the secret dish is the thing. Like, the actors who were playing the people, they know what really happened. Yeah. Like, it's all this big reveal that never gets revealed. There's, like, no fruition to it. So, I guess we're supposed to think that Doc hadn't killed Half Hand is a big deal? I, I, who fucking cares? I feel like, and then what happens after is, like, shortly after Maxie dies. I feel like this. It's very Danny Mall. It's very, like, yeah. low-key. But I feel like. This was the bigger point because after Maxie dies, you have Sam going into grief mode again. And remember, Sam hasn't like really expressed grief since like her mother died. So they go home 
And, like, Michael's basically shouting at her. And Michael's twin and, like, one of the 50 million cousins are downstairs. And they're like, hey, should we stop this? And, like, finally Sam breaks. And, like, that was much more important in moving. Yeah. Like, Sam actually, like, cries. And, like, she cries for hours. And, like, just cries about everything that's bad and sad in her life. And, like... And everybody's like, I mean, it is incredibly bad and, then, and sad that, like, this young woman, yeah. um, you know, had this awful thing happen to her in 1928, yeah. too. I mean, like, just, like, sometimes you just cry about how shitty the world is. Yeah, so... Yeah. Okay, so that happens, and then, like, <laughs> basically the no, book... it's not over yet. Oh, my God. So, you find out that Maxie had used the money, obviously, to help half hands like, child. Uh, obviously? <laughs> Well, because, like, he's got, like, a, a lawyer grandson who's got, like, you know, ink marks on his hand. But also, like, she had taken the money, and they were, like, at first they're, like, oh, she spent it. But then they found out, like, she had bought art. So they're, like, more millionaires. Yes. And, but, Which like, doesn't matter, because they were already millionaires. And, like, and the point is, is, like, you know, Sam Throwing is pregnant with twins. And, you know. A litter. She's going to have a litter. Is learned to be happy. And, you know. And, again, we'll get into this, like, for the other hour and a half that is this insane book. Um, well, like, when we come back from break, because there's crazy great things about this book and like super crazy problematic things about it we can um, talk about all of them because guess them. what you're gonna spend so much of the rest of your life thinking about this book that you know what <laughs> i bet some of you are gonna fucking read it oh my god it's the craziest thing but so we have maybe hold no, on we do no we can edit it it's fine just go just go okay just go. okay so this is our second installment of our super fun Kiss Your Mama With That Mouth segment. So, if you remember from last time, what we're trying to do is get some of the fun ladies that we know. Does it have to be a lady? Like, no, it doesn't have to be a lady. It should be somebody older who it would be funny yeah. for them to say a bad word. Yeah. So, this segment we have because if you know anything about the Jude Devereaux series, you have the Taggarts from Colorado and you have the Montgomery's from Maine. So my sister-in-law, the lovely April. No, oh, I'm sure she's very lovely. I've not met her. April, her mother is named Sally, Miss Sally. And Miss Sally is from Sullivan, Maine. And she has lived in Maine for 70 years. Some fun facts about Miss Sally. Miss Sally is an artist, so she does awesome, like, wine glass paintings and super, thing, like, fun things like that. Um, she's a breast cancer survivor. She's the most fun. And so she is going to be reading from this book. So enjoy Miss Sally. I'm so looking forward to hearing Miss Sally read. I mean, it's the best. Poor, poor Sally has to deal with me somewhat drunk every Thanksgiving being like, oh my God, the way you talk is the most fun. You know, I, well, I'll talk now because I already talked. I've always said that the Maine accent is actually more like the Southern accent. It is. It's like, it's like a little like, yeah, it's like a cross section. Because I did my, um, you know, that thing where you, uh, you, you say a traditionally rigged schooner and you're like, yeah, yeah, that thing you did, that sounds (laughs) fascinating, Sarah. But the captain was so fucking Maine. And and his accent was completely unlike mine, especially when he talked about how today was going to be a bombana, which oh. meant it was going to be 85 oh degrees. God, also, random Sally fact, her favorite dog is a St. Bernard. Oh. And she's probably seen more moose than we can imagine. Oh, so, well, in, I've never seen a moose. I've in, been to Alaska and never seen a moose. Enjoy Miss Sally. Enjoy Miss Sally. And these cousins lived in Maine? She asked as she bit into a bran muffin. Yeah, there was hostility in his voice, and she wondered what his cousins had done to cause his antagonism. Seeing the look on her face, he began to explain. It's a tradition in my family that the Montgomery kids spend half the summer in Colorado and the Tagrits half in Maine. I don't know who started that tradition, but I'm sure he's roasting in hell right now. Oh, what happened when you were in Maine? My bastard cousins tried to kill us. You must be kidding. Not in the least. They did everything they could to see that we didn't live through the summers. 
The lot of them live on the sea and they're half fish. My brother says they have fish scales for skin. They used to do things like row us out into the ocean, then dive off the boat and swim back to shore. They knew that none of us could swim. How'd you get back to shore? Michael smiled in a smirking way. Mm, Road. We couldn't swim, but all of us had a bit of muscle. Samantha smiled at the way he flexed his biceps when he said this. And what happened when they came to Colorado? Well, we were a bit muffed at the way they treated us when we were in Maine. Understandable. And two, you have to understand the Montgomery's. They are the most annoying bunch in the world. They were always thanking my mother. They never forgot to use their napkins at the table. And they folded their clothes. That bad, huh? Sam said, hiding her smile in her cup. But Mike didn't seem to hear the sarcasm in her voice. We all felt we were justified in what we did. We put them on the wildest horses we could find. We used to talk them take them into the woods of the Rocky Mountains and leave them alone at night with no food or water without any covering. Wasn't that dangerous? Hell no, not to a Montgomery. As far as we could tell, they're not killable. One of my brothers took one of them out, put the son of a gun at the end of a rope, lowered the rope down a cliffside, and went off and left my cousin hanging there. Mike smiled in memory. It was 200 feet down. I hope y'all enjoyed that bananas, <laughs> like, retelling of... I feel like with Sally reading it, it becomes, what if Jude Devereaux was actually Stephen King? Because that is the most Stephen King voice, and... Y'all, she's the best. She is just the nicest, sweetest lady, and I love her, and thank you, Sally, for doing this. Thank you, Sally. All right, so we are on questions. Question time. Oh, boy. So, God, y'all. I know. Oh, we Lord. Like, okay, okay. I this book is so complicated. It's not even that long. I know, it's not even long, but there's it's a like lot of... There's 350 a, pages or something. There's a lot of shit happening. Oh, my God. All right, so question number one. Big dick energy or big dick energy? I'm a little, I'm more touring than you are. Yeah. I, He's supposed to be fantasy. So I get it. Yeah. Uh, he lies to her, though. And, like, lying to me is, like, the thing. That's, like, yeah. the, that's that's the thing. That's the, the deal breaker. I feel like, here's, I, I guess, again, I feel him, like, as very much a daddy character. Mm. So. That's supposed to be the appeal, for sure. My... I understand exactly what you're talking about, like, because he is a fucking liar. And I feel like if we were dealing with... It's even called to be a liar. But I feel like if it was... If this was a book that was, like, put in a rational (laughs) situation, I'd have a lot more problems with it. That's true. It's clearly... out of every single man that has been around her... Oh, well, he's an improvement. No, I was like, but he's the only one who's, like, at least given her some sort of agency. So, uh, I just, okay, like, lying, I would rather you punch me in the face than lie to me. I get it, but uh, he is such a little, like, he's such the Jude Devereaux fantasy, and, you know, he's a power lifter. Like, <laughs> like we said we were going to come back to it. He's a power lifter. Like, you get the feeling that he's just, like, supposed to be, like, blunt force dick trauma, like, with this guy. <laughs> to your face and other parts. Yeah, so. I, I mean, okay, yeah, he was hot and written as hot. Okay, so, hmm. And this is hard to compare. And, I, you know, I, I keep going back to what we were talking about yeah. with our girls at, uh, at Womance talking about how modern romances are just weirdly not confident in the same way that these old-fashioned romances right. are, which will just smash you to fucking shit with their dicks. Right. Because, okay, so I read Prepub for work, because that's, like, my actual yeah. job is to read this shit now, is um, I read the Bromance Book Club, which came out, I think, like, either last month or earlier this oh, month. Oh, is that the... I feel that one's Well, I fucking familiar. hated it. it. Even though, I mean, I finished it, because, like, it was well-written. Um, but I hated it because I felt so fucking pandered to. Yeah. Like, if I didn't know that the author was a woman, I would have suspected it was a man pretending to be a woman. Right. Like, there's a point at which he takes her to the craft store to buy washi tape. 
Because women like washi tape. I, I don't feel, like to be fucking pandered to. I, you know, like, okay, the things I like about... <sighs> but no, what I'm saying is I like this better yeah. because it's more confident. It's got more of a, like, like just, I'm just going to fucking go for it. I'm going to go 100%. I feel I'm like gonna, what happens with the Jude Devereaux dude with my dick. is that they're just hot dudes that really are just dudes. Like, for me, what she writes... They're a like, little dim. Well, it's, it's... They're a little dim. Yeah, but I feel like they're placeholders because I don't think, and I felt like this with our last book with Wishes, Mm -hmm. like, Michael Taggart is no one really that interesting. Like, we don't really know enough about him. All he is is to be there to enable her to be a more fully actualized person. And I felt like that was the case with the the dude in Wishes. So, like, he's fine. He's never going to be in my, like, top whatever, but, like, I'm banging the shit out of him. Just because he's just, like, a fond, you like, I feel like he's, like, on, a, like, a computer program. Like, it's not about him, it's about her. Yeah. And so I think that's what's really interesting about her thing. Now, I will say, like, he's got this weird thing about white underwear <laughs> that I found to be very sexy, like. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. there's, like, a part of the book where, like, he's got this, like, thing with white underwear. Like, when he was in... There's a weird bleach accident. It's well, no, it wasn't like when he was in yeah. high school. He took his sister, brought all of her like like her gaggle of hot college friends home, and they're probably like cousins. And he took all of their under like their clothes and put it in the like washer and put it on hot with like white like with bleach, and so everything was like tight and white. That was hot, and the sex was hot. The sex that is they that, had. We'll was get hot. to that later because yeah. I have things about the sex. Yeah. No, the thing is. I, he is supposed to be, I think what Jude Devereaux's thought is. She never writes like a fully actualized dude. No. She writes fully actualized women, and I can appreciate no, that. No, her women are always like legit real women. Yeah. I think that her men, is her her plan is to write the man that you don't feel like you can say you want. Yeah. Which is how you end up with what you were talking about, daddies. Yeah. And so this guy is trying to protect her, lying to her. And to yeah. me, that is fucking abhorrent. Yeah. But to many women... And I guess it didn't bother me in this book so much because, like, we've talked about before, like, everything in this book is dialed up to, like, fucking yes. 11. Yes. Like, everybody's a mega Somebody strangles her and it barely matters. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I was just like, eh, whatever. Yeah, but I mean, I think that that is yeah. part of what she's trying to do is she's trying to give you what you won't admit that you want, right. she thinks. But it's giving this very weirdly individualized, just like with witches, yeah. where she's like revealing that she's got some serious fucking issues oh with body yeah. because she's telling you that a 163-pound woman is, is so fat obese, morbidly that people obese. would like stop in the street and be like, and damn, point and stare, God like, damn. Did you, did you, did you see isn't that? that? Isn't that the wildest Jesus. thing that, like, you still remember that number? 163, five. yes, I absolutely still And there was a that. really interesting, I think it was, like, Sarah McLean um, on Twitter was talking about a book that she had read where somebody had given a number, and she was like, nope. She's like, stop fucking doing this. And I was like, and I, you know, I, I shared this story. I was like, I read this when I was, like, in seventh grade, and I still Remember, 163 pounds yes. being the point of being grotesque. And we are talking about, like, stare at in the street fat. Yes. So, it's it's wild to me. Like, yes. she's, on one hand, so amazing, and then, like, really But, you know, you wonder it. if, okay, so maybe that has to be the same, the two sides of the same coin. Yeah. And if, if what she's trying to do, and what people find very compelling about her, is that she's giving you what you won't admit you want also means yeah. that you're getting that psychological baggage where you're well, like, oh shit, girl, I don't know, because put that like, back in the bag. Well, I, she was one of the few that I had ever read where like somebody wasn't, let's say, described as being a size two, and like you should have to sell for but that. No, but no, but what, but what I'm saying, like, but what I'm saying is in the like '90s, like. Now you have all of kinds of amazing, which is awesome, body positivity things. But like the cover had a pie on it. Wait, but when I'm, you know, in the '90s, it's hard to find books about normal looking people. So, all right, it, it's, it's an interesting thing, and I would like to hear your thoughts on it because I do think that what she's getting at here is some deeper psychological business, and that's why people like her. However, 
I do think it comes with this, like, you know, it comes with some stuff. And so I want to know what y'all think about it. I think, and I mean. Waiter at us. I feel like this gets into, like, what you're talking about, like, when, like, with our question, too. Would you talk shit with or about the heroin? So here's the thing about this for me. And I, you know, I don't mean to, like, over talk anybody, but, like. This oh, kind of, oh, you know, not too late. It's only been a year and some. <laughs> oh, whatever. You're the queen of over talking. Like, I is, know, I know. This I'm is just where you like just devolve over. Like, <sighs> this is it. But everybody says that you should separate your um your your podcast into like two audio <laughs> files, and then you should stop when you over talk. Oh <laughs> uh, okay. Oh no, that's what we do. Next. So I think what's interesting, I I'm Sam, on. It just bothered the shit out of me at the beginning of the book. Like, I was just like, oh, God, all right, we get it, we get it. Just be excited that you get to live in New York in this amazing place. It's just, like, like so prickly all the time. Because the the other thing that I found that we didn't really even touch on in the book is, like, she is kind of the queen, aside from, like, the first makeout where... Can we say the word frigid? It's it's not a very loaded word. But, like, she's mixed messages. Like, she is throwing some hot shit at him, and then when he reacts to it, she treats him like a criminal. And his uh, her, you know, his reaction is completely on the mark when he's like, oh, shit. Was she abused? Yeah. Was she sexually assaulted? I mean, and and it it completely reads 1,000% accurate. And so, like, you know, when she first, when the very first moment she meets the stripper, she's like, (laughs) and then, like, she finally, like, lightens up. And, like, I feel like she really does draw a lot of comparisons to me, like, with our character, like, with the, the, the girl character from the Hood book. Where she's got a lot of trauma going on. But, like, what's nice to see in this is, like, I still hate that bitch from the hood. Like, she doesn't oh, yeah. deserve Matthew No, Cuttery. she doesn't. <laughs> but, like, Sam, like, sort of softens and loosens up. And, like, she's still not my all-time favorite. But, like, I feel like she's a really good example of, like, someone who's prickly. That, like... She felt like very much a real person. Yeah. All of Jude Devereux's people actually, like, yes. they're women. Not the men. The men are, like, fake people. But the, the women really feel like There's real this people. really funny moment. And, like, and, and Jude Devereux, like, if she just would be straight up funny, she's so funny. So there's a part where her and Michael have already, like, fucked it out. And finally. They're going to the nursing home that Maxie's in. And there's a part where she's like, hey, Michael, can we stop at the bookstore? I want to get some books for my, <laughs> my, my grandmother. And Because like, it's a very sterile nursing well, home. Well, he's like, okay. So they get there, and, like, again, Michael's rich as shit. And she's like, well, what can I buy? And he does this thing, and, like, and this is how Jude describes it. Like, Michael does this condescending thing where he's like, well, whatever, you can get in 20 minutes. And, like, her description of it, Jude is like, she... It, it is really, like, I want to know more about Jude Deborah because she's like, the biggest mistake that happens in marriage is the day after you get married, the wife makes breakfast and does all this stuff and, like, creates this, like, thing that the husband expects. So, I wonder if Jude's okay because she also been in the kitchen, which is, yes. like, a thing, like, right? So, so what, like, Martina McBride. Is so, she okay? So, what happens <laughs> is, like, Michael does this, like, Okay. 20 minutes. Okay, sweetie. You have 20 minutes. And then, like, Sam gets everyone in the bookstore involved. And she's like a big old nerd for science fiction, and she gets, it's great. Oh, my God. And she gets, like, some comic book kids. They high-five each other. Like, she gets everybody. She doesn't, in, like, it's a contest. She do, Yes, it's like Supermarket Sweep. And then all of a sudden. You know what I read about Supermarket Sweep? They had to make the ham really heavy. <laughs> Because you you would have to get the ham. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, and then like, there's this really like. So she's doing that. So, and I guess she writes really funny when she wants to. So, all of a sudden, she has basically bought out an entire like Barnes and Noble. It's so great. And then like, the the cashier who is typical cashier, like, are you fucking kidding me? I have to like, do this shit. And How then, about a 15% discount? She's like, bitch. She's, she's like, what kind of discount are you going to give me? And then, like, they fight with the cabbie to get all the things uh, in there. So there there amazing. are things about her I really liked because I do like a Jude Devereaux female character. And I feel like 
I think what's interesting, because if you look at the people that, I mean, obviously there's Danielle Steele and all these others, but, you know, like if you're looking at like a Joanna Lindsay type, she never gives her female characters so much. I'm really wondering if it is possible to truly enjoy a Jude Devereux book if you're not a woman. Because yeah. the men are so shell characters and the women are such... Fully uh, fleshed out. Like, well, no, and that's not what I'm, Yes, they are fully fleshed out. I'm not saying that like a man can enjoy no, a fully fleshed woman. No, no, but... but it's fan service. It's like yeah. completely there to but, make a woman specifically who is in maybe not that great a relationship feel good. But see, I don't even know. It's, if it's like Kathy or something. I mean, I it's don't like know. I was like to me, I don't take it as it's empowering. I don't take it as fan service service as so much as like I hear you. I it didn't. It didn't you. piss me off like that fucking washi tape thing in the Bromance Book Club, yeah. which I did pan by the way in my library review, and I did not get mentioned in library reads. Oh. So, I mean, I, I do like, I do really like aspects of Sam. I think that she's a really fleshed out character. I think that she's got a lot fucking going on with her. I think that a woman's studies major could make a lot out of these books. Oh my god, so There's much. There's so much hay to be made here. I, I do think that it is absolutely too, it is for a very specific yes. woman in the audience. And that woman is... Maybe dissatisfied with her, well, certainly dissatisfied with her life. Maybe dissatisfied with her marriage. I don't, you know what? I or don't her even, lack of relationships or I something. I don't even know if it's like, you know what? I don't even think it's a dissatisfaction. I think it could might be like, you annoyed at somebody because like, oh, they're not. Yeah, I mean, like we all go through. It's a very specific fantasy man, and I'm having a yeah. hard time putting my finger on exactly what it is because it's not like that fucking take my wife boomer humor. No, it's not what it is at all. These are always this and the guy in wishes. They are sensitive, smart, yeah. we, like men. They meet your needs, but they also lie to you in this weird, specific way. Yeah. So I don't know. It's it's really complicated, and I want to know what you think, America. Tell us. Yeah, you won't, but you should. <laughs> All right. So, are the women in this Virginia Woolf or Phyllis Schlafly? There are a lot of female friendships in this. You know, it, again, I feel like this book is really, like, it's very women. -like. Her description of, like, divorce and, like, women in general and, like, again, women, female friendships is really empowering. And I think, insofar as, like, I feel like, Jude Devereux is kind of important because she's saying for a lot of people what they can't voice, you know, like, mm. and again, you got to remember, like, this is not, not to say that they, I mean, it's the 80s, 90s, like, think about the sheer genius of the, the crazy, the, the kitchen from Wishes yes. and like. I've been thinking about that a lot. And like know? how she describes like marriage in this one. He's trying to get at what women, she thinks, yeah. right or wrong, what women really want. Mm -hmm. And, and like, not in that very no. superficial, like women just want their husbands to like sit on the couch. Like again, I think. Like a husband couch, at, like when you try and stuff. What I thought was really really cool about this book. One of the, the things that, like, got me is that when Sam meets Michael, for all intents and purposes of what Michael is, like, she's super, super fucking jaded. And rightly so. Like, her husband basically... I remember, like, one of the things that I, always stuck with me is, like, when her husband tells her he wants to write the great American novel, he tells her he's profoundly unhappy. And I remember, like... That's the word that she remembers him using is profoundly. Mm. So, like, she works at, like, basically, like, a circuit city during the day and then, like, is a... A venusis? Or, well, or an aerobics instructor at night. Well, and no, okay. And then after that at night, she's... I don't know how you actually, like, yeah. say the word. Is it Evanusis? Is it, like, she's his scribe. His, yeah. Um, so Probably then, fixing his pros and shit. Yeah, you know, and, like, thing. basically being the person that's writing his shit for him. And then... She's so, when she meets Michael, who's like, I mean, obviously Michael is problematic in himself, but I feel like the things that you're supposed to take away from him, the important things, 
is like, here's the dude that wants to hear about your day. Yes. Here's the dude that thinks you're attractive what, as you are. Like, what I think is really interesting is, okay, so she goes on this fantasy shopping spree. Yeah. Whatever. Um, it's like a montage. It's great. It's silly. Like, whatever. And so he is on the husband couch. You yes. know the husband couch. But However, like he is really involved. involved. He wants to see it. He wants and to the, know. That's the thing. Is like, I that's felt like all you want your husband to do when he's on the husband couch. He could have been on... Like, obviously, it's amplified because of this book, but, like, he could have been on the husband couch couch at, like, Sears or, like, at Walmart or wherever. That that wasn't the point. The point was that he was... Oh, I like the white stuff. Yeah. Like, that he was interested in. And so, I think that is really super... That's the fantasy, just that he gives a shit about what you think. She meets people from, like, again, I feel like, again, this is a 90s woke book you know she's meeting people from different cross sections she's meeting people who are strippers she meets people who are sex workers and like after her initial like eh, like she's cool with it and like yeah. makes friends and like she makes good female friendships yes. and i think what's important is like at first she doesn't want these female friendships but then it's like hey bitch like mm-hmm. not her you know not everybody is terrible right so. Uh, so I have a question. This is not in the questions. Okay. You said when we were talking about first reading this book, that uh, of course you had got yeah. it. Yeah, you got it. And then you're like, I read this book so much that I can just kind of like, uh, was this book fucking crazy to you or not? I think it was very As a grown up. <sighs> were you able to distance yourself enough? Or when I was like, Bleh! Were no, you- I think it was. You know what? I, I I think it's always had like. <sighs> there's certain romance novels that you're like, oh, I'm just gonna revisit it because it's fun for me because it like holds a thing <laughs> for me and like this is one of those for me. Like, uh, yes, obviously it is insane. Like I've like what I've. But always... you went read it this time. Were you able to see that? Well, I've. Here's the thing. Like this time, I was. <sighs> Usually what I would do is, like, compartmentalize the weird maxi stuff and just be like, whatever. I don't care about this. But, like, reading it now is, like, I have to take all of that into consideration. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know. Okay, so there's, like, certain books that I'm, like, will reread the fuck out of. So this is one of those. There's also, like, the, like, the entire, like, Julia Quinn Bridgerton series. Mm-hmm. There's the... Lisa Clefos, like, Clefos, however you say her name, like, the Wallflower series, like, those are books that I will read the shit out of, you know? And I'm like, yeah. But, I mean, like, when you were trying to read it with a critical eye. Oh, yeah, I mean, like. Was it like, what the fuck? Or was it like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know what? Like, I feel like. there. No, I feel like I was like, hey, I read this when I was like 16. And yeah, obviously there are things that I'm like, eh, about, but more so than not, I'm like, oh, no, no, no. This is about a grown ass woman that is divorced. No, it would not be embarrassed. That is like rediscovering herself and like actually discovering herself. So, like, yeah, like, I'm down with her. I'm totally cool with like. I'll be like, read this shit. Like, oh, wait till we get to Sarah's birthday stuff. It's gonna mm-hmm. be some business happening there. So yeah. So okay, when it comes to consent, is this book more Robin Thicke or Marvin Gaye? All right. So you have an issue. Like to me, yeah, I do. We have different interpretations of that first thing. No, I'm sorry. I don't care who you are. You cannot not say your name and just put your tongue in somebody's mouth. But here's the thing. Like I feel like she. No, you don't get to say that my opinion doesn't account. I like, know, but I'm saying yeah, she like, never no. invited. No, she no, was not she, a person. She who was would. into it. Like, what happens is Let's he started. He catches her. She's got fucking thirst face. He puts his face down. She doesn't smack him away. She doesn't do anything. She is full on into it from the jump. And then she put he puts her in this completely vulnerable position. Yeah, she was for it. She until until she realized, mm-hmm. hey, this is who I am. I'm gonna go no. It seemed weirdly out of character. That whole first scene is like she he, she It's wrote a weird it and, scene. I'm not saying it's not it's a, a weird, weird scene, scene, but I'm saying If we were to cut out that scene, it would be completely fine. Although it's weird through the whole rest of the thing, she's like, 
He's like, oh, I want to fucking bang her. She won't let me talk about anything except for she'll but let me kiss her like, all no. the time. He doesn't say it like that. No, no, no. But what he's saying is like, she'll let me kiss her. As in, like, he will kiss, and when he says kiss, I mean, we're talking, like, make out. They will make the fuck out, and then she'll, like, shut it down. Because she remembers, That's like, a communication problem. But, I'm... Um, and y'all should talk about that. I, but she won't, like, and she doesn't talk about things. She just shuts down. But he doesn't really... Tr- I, it, it's yeah. weird. It's weird, okay? We have I mean, no, I mean, he respects her boundaries after that first... Time. Again, that we, first time I do not like it. I don't, and that's I fine don't. to me. That first time was like her being like, I guess you got to um, do, what, what do you call it when you, gotta, you, you know, um, like sort of lawnmower? You gotta let vroom, vroom. you gotta do like that. I guess you gotta do that to a romance novel sometimes. The way that I interpreted that scene was like all of a sudden she was just like temporarily like, yes, this is the stuff. All of a sudden I'm going to do what I want and then remembered, oh shit, no, I don't do that. No, she was terrified. She was in a not strange terrified. place. She was not terrified. After having she been was, in a cab oh, because yes. she's a racist piece of shit. Oh, she was thirsty for it. We are going to, like, this will this will be the breakup of the podcast. Like, no, uh, the Michael's going to have it in resorts. Are we the gonna Michael, bring up the, over the Michael, I'm just saying that we have a hard line disagreement about this. So, uh, well, the, okay. So let us exclude that scene. Other than that scene, it is very consent. Oh my god! Yes, so much. He's so. very sensitive. To like her they don't, needs. they don't yes. have sex until like page. And when they have it, she wants it. And like, there's, there's a really great scene. Okay, because like her whole no, thing- no, 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 don't wait it, wait it, wait it, because oh. we're gonna be on the d- Dogger yeah. Pages thing. Oh, we have a lot to talk about the sex scenes. Okay. Yes. All right. It's good. No, wait, wait a moment. Okay. Belay, belay, belay mm-hmm. that. All right. So, <laughs> how badly <laughs> you're judging your mom for reading this book? Well, I stole it from my mom, so not at all. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, as long as we're okay with our mamas reading any of this shit, this, this shit is okay shit. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm here Would for Scarlett it. Johansson be in the movie? Scarlett Johansson is right now calling Ornette a racist for asking oh God, why the- she would ever sing. And th- it's not that she sings the blues. Please don't misunderstand me. Anybody can sing the blues, but acting like you own the blues? Yeah. No, you cannot fucking like, do that. There's racial appropriation of the blues, and like... It's just like she gets the. It's not even that she sings the blues because she studied the blues, or because I, she like listened to the blues like put on by black performers. It's just the blues flow through her. You know, like Fuck I feel her. like okay, if you wanted to do this, like you could have talked about, you could have talked about the Marilyn Monroe Bessie Smith story. That's like all of a sudden just no, now. It's, um, it's not Bessie Smith. It's um oh shit, what's her name? Really? Oh fuck her. Um, I can't think of her name. I can see her face. Yeah. But yes, where um where there was an African American artist who wanted yeah. to play at a club, and Marilyn Monroe was like, "Okay, I'm gonna support you. I'm gonna be there every fucking night." And therefore yeah. they had to. Um, and Jesus, I, what is her name? I can oh, I can see her face. But anyway, so I think it's just like we clearly don't edit this. Yeah, totally not editing. <laughs> yeah, it's that she appropriates this, and she feels like that she owns the blues because sad things have happened to her. Which is not what the blues are about. No, the blues I, are about sad things plus. Well, again, like like we said, like you can have sad things happen to you, but like sad things happening to you versus being oppressed, yeah, are completely different things. Sad things happening to you systemically are different from sad things just happening yeah, to you. Like, and the fact that she calls Ornette a racist is the only reason we're even talking about this. Yeah, I mean that was that was the part like, ugh. Ugh. and they like, act like it's funny. Like, oh yeah, she just called Ornette a racist. Ornette is a struggling. Lives in a quarter, an eighth, a thirty second yeah. of an apartment in nowhere. This woman owns the world in a five thousand dollar suit and calls him a racist. Like she just shows up. She show like the thing that I, like the thing that I just oh. again infuriate Elephant Gerald mm. is who. Oh, yeah. thank you. Thank okay, you. so again, Michael and Sam show up to Harlem. Yeah. Across the hundred fucking tenth street. In their car. In their car with a bodyguard. And they don't they own, go to, they they, go to Jubilee's like 
a ratty ass fucking apartment. And bam, like, bam, 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 bam. I say just like. And then like Ornell's like fuck this bitch, and then all of a sudden she's like gonna sing. Basically, what she's gonna do is the imitation of the blues, and she's gonna act like that buys her entrance. Mm-hmm. Fuck you, Sam. Oh my god, it was the and then like and then like. Like I said, like, yeah, there's a part later where she calls him racist. That's for the saying thing. that, that white people thing. can't sing the blues. And then, like, they're talking to, like we said, they're talking to Jubilee, who lived through Jim Crow, who and, lived through. And who lost his livelihood when this club got shot out by a sack full of crackers. Yeah. It's the original Cracker Barrel. There were a yeah, barrel full of crackers like, while shot And there was, like, yeah. you know, like, he lived through fucking Emmett Till and shit like that. And it's like, Ho, 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 he's met his match. Well, he's got to do that. Like, I mean, like, yeah, he, it was he knows very, how you, like, like survive. Jim Crow, like, Fuck it. fucking Step awkward. and fetch it, fucking bullshit. Oh, it was, that shit was upsetting. Because, again, yeah. I felt like this was very much, like. It was so out of place, which means. This was some. People didn't notice it back then. Judevra was woke, you know. Uh, oh. You can say, the thing is, if you're going to put it in at all, you say the word racist, you're going to throw it in there, but you think you know some shit. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a, um, we have an interloper. But he won't talk. (laughs) He's wearing a red hat. I bet if I asked him about a, I bet if I asked him about a, a white lady saying that a black man who says a white woman can't sing the blues is racist, he'd have opinions. He's agreed in it. He's, he's just white walking. people can't sing the blues. There we go. White people, can't, we can't sing the blues. It's like hard line. We can't. Fuck it. We can sing soul. Like blue eyed soul is okay. I mean, but again, but you a, can't act. Okay, the yeah. thing is, she could have sung the songs if she had. A, no, she, no. I, if she'd done her footnotes, if she'd yeah. been like, okay, this is an amazing song yeah. that Bessie Smith sang. Yeah. It's okay to sing a song, like, but you have to like you can't you can't erase other people. No, exactly. You can't and, and claim you, their pain. Oh, you, you know what? Like, hey, hey, Ornette. Like you, you know, I I've had a bad time of it, but you know, you never got the opportunities that I got. But you know, it's the same. I do. Th- I mean, in my five thousand dollars suit, I do think that there's a difference between somebody singing like "God Bless the Child That's Got His Own" and somebody singing "Strange Fruit." Well, I mean, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that a white woman can sing God Bless a Child That's Got His Own if they give appropriate credit right. to, you know, and that's fine. A white woman should shut your fitch mouth when it comes to yeah. singing Strange Fruit. Yeah, I mean, obviously, like, God, if I, oh God, I don't know what I would do if a white woman sang Strange Fruit. I bet it's happened. I bet you any money has happened. Oh, what's that? Okay. All right, so, anyway... Okay, that's what happened. You're not leaving the house looking like that. So many outfits. Oh my god, so many outfits. So we've got granny panties that are legitimately blood stained granny panties. We yeah. have the insane outfits from her shopping spree. It also has like crazy like um hoe garments from when she like sneaks up on the like oh. crappy bar business. She like she uses like Michael's cousin like for like a spandex like red yeah outfit. it's weird like there's a lot of clothes stuff in this some yes. of it is weird and uncomfortable you know one of the things that really like that <laughs> stuck with me weirdly and like i feel like it's super oh, like topical. a bloodstained dress is that well, no. you? but like after they do the whole big shopping spree they're in the cosmetics department and they buy a bottle of trezor mm-hmm like, by Lancome, and I was like, yeah. really, this, like, $65 bottle of, like, Lancome perfume is, like, what we're going to talk about? But, like, I was like, hell shit, like, fucking A, we could have trade. Maybe they got the Eau de Parfum. Yeah. They got, like, the Eau thing, like, the thing that got, like, the little bottle. It made me it's... feel like it was so Danielle Steely, like, oh, with yes. the outfits. Like, because yes. there were so many outfits. Powers, I mean, it was always suits. It was never suits. dresses, skirts, but it was suits. Nobody is ever just, like, in jeans. So, when I was not that much older than this, so maybe 15, maybe three years after this, my dad bought for my mother, and when he bought things for my mother, after a certain point, he bought a lesser version for me, usually, and it's oh, a little weird. Okay, so he got us Chanel number five. Yeah. And he got us, um... Uh, not, well, not eau de parfum, which is, uh, you, yeah. you can't be in a room with somebody 
But I guess I'll just follow the You got the black thing. You, you got the black you spriss, column, right? Yes. And you spriss, I have the black column, And then yeah. you leap like a gazelle five yeah. minutes later through it. Because otherwise, people just will here. just sneeze. Yeah. Oh it is a heavy scent. Oh, it's so an extremely though. heavy scent. But it was a big deal to me my mom. Oh, I can imagine, like, being a teenager getting your Chanel number no. five. Like, oh, I have mine. I still have it. It's, like, probably, like, sour by this point. But, like. I don't think it goes bad because um I think that they, at some point, changed some of those recipes so they don't yeah. have, like, the butt grease or the civet. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I may, and you may still have the butt grease of the city. Yeah. And it's and funny actually, to think about, like, what you use as, like, what your scents were, you know, like. What does rich even smell like, right? Oh, my God. It's... Because, you know, rich people don't actually, like, spray yeah, like a gazelle yeah. through uh, Chanel number no. 5. Yeah. But my dad, like, that was, like, a thing that he gave us. And it oh, was so huge. Sweet. It was huge. I get it. Yeah. I right. get it. Would your 12-year-old self dog-eared anything? Let's talk about the fucking in this fucking book. It's really good. It is good. Okay, so there's, okay, so you find out that, like, in the book, the whole time there's, like, this intimation, and, like, not even intimation, but, like, everybody's like, hey, has Sam been sexually abused? Cause because so... it makes, it would completely make sense based on her reactions to other people. So, and. Stereotypically. And, and what I think is greatly written about her is that. You can see her kind of unwinding. And so, like, she'll be super into Michael, and she's like, ah, get away from me. Mm-hmm. So, she she does this, like, big seduction scene where she's going to seduce him, and she's eating salsa, and it's stupid. But, <laughs> but, like, what was interesting, like, oh, so she's asking Michael, like, Michael is, like, that. And I think what was, the other thing that I liked about this, and maybe it's not great for me to like it, but, like, Oh, no. She's giving thirst eyes to him. He's touching her. And then she's like, Duh! unleash me. And, so, you know, and it's like, it makes him feel like he's a sexual predator. And he's like, I, you, nah. he's, he's a good guy. He does yeah, not he's want like, stop to. Stop making me feel like, like he's like, yeah. he's like, basically, like, please stop making me feel like I'm a rapist. Yeah. Because you're giving me these signs and then I'm doing things and then you're just like, don't fucking touch me. I hate you. I freeze up. So she goes to this club and this is her mechanism. Yeah. She's like in a slutty red dress. And, and it like, makes sense to me. Like, yeah, I get yeah. this. I can't believe get She's this. putting the moves on Michael. She's asking him about his power lifting. I, I actually get this more than I get and on like, my bar when she puts on her grandma's underpants. And like the, <laughs> the power lifting, like she's talking about like his like shirt and how she's just like taking this. You know, and he's like telling her stuff and he's like, I don't understand what you want from me. And like she tries to put the moves on him again. And then she freezes up, you know, and they're in the cab, and, like, they finally have fucking hot sex. It's, 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 this is the whole, actually, like, real people fucking the up first all the time. T- like, the first time doing it wasn't that good. Like, he's like, hey, babe, I got too excited. Next time's for you. And she's like, what do you mean? And so, like, it's real, like, it's, it's like real people. Yeah. yeah. And then, like, so... <sighs> She's just looking at him, like, the second sex this scene. This is so fucking hot to the me. Sex scene, sec, the second sex scene, she's I, basically, she has admitted yeah. to him that she's like, she's like, I'm terrible at sex. My ex-husband told me I was the worst, and I don't. And this is her trauma. Yeah. It's, it's, it's and, legit trauma, And she's though. like, I don't want you to have sex with me, and then it takes it seriously yeah, because it, this oh, man oh. created emotional trauma for her so, and is not treated lightly. No. She, he said, her husband said that she was bad yes, at sex. And, and I a little bit, okay, I don't want to do this because so many romance novels do this and it's bad, bad, bad. Writing is homophobic. But I a little bit wondered if maybe her husband was not in the I didn't women. feel that. I felt like, like to me, what it was more. Like, he felt like it should be in the women he wasn't. He was having was. affairs with people and stuff. Um, That's like, true. Yeah. I feel like it was more about her. Again, I feel like she creates these characters that, like, are hyper whatever. I feel like she was like, hey, a lot of ladies think they're bad at sex. So that was her whole hang up. Well, not her whole hang up. It was that's the way that she could explain yeah. her hang up. So what happens is like after they have sex, and it's like good. It's it's good. She didn't like get off on it, but like she she was like, hey, this is enjoyable. And then she's looking at Michael, who's a snack. Like he's yeah. a whole fucking snack. And she's like, hey, I've never looked at a he dude. He did not skip leg day. She's like, I've never looked at a dude. Kind of just like 
touch you and mess with you. And he's like, he just rolls over onto us. He realizes that like his front is making her nervous. So he just rolls over onto his like stomach and like just lets her it is so touch him. Hot. And like it is hella fucking hot. It's he really... hides his face because like, you know, you're looking at somebody's yeah. face to make yourself conscious. And uh, frankly, a dick can make people self conscious. It was so really like, good. And like she's oh like she gets herself worked up. And there's like a part oh. where like she's like she's she's licking his like ass crease. Yeah, and it's all right. Like, yeah, and she's like, "Hey, Michael, do you think he you think he can go?" She because her her husband had been like her husband had said, "Oh, you, you more than once a night, I can't. You're a fucking bitch." Like yeah, and so she tells Michael she, like ho. all yeah. like timidly, she's like, "Do you think you'd be game again?" And like he basically just like rams <laughs> into her, and it's a really funny <laughs> line because he's yeah. like he's all scared, he hurts her. And, She's like, golly, Michael, I think you can. <laughs> golly. So it's like really she, golly. Oh, God, it's so, it no, is, the sex it's is really sex good. positive. And like, oh. I love that, like, he, again, it's this Jude Devereaux man that knows, like, what somebody wants. Like, he's just there for her to, like, be more open with her own shit, you know? Yeah, he's entirely about her mm-hmm. business. And it is, uh, Amazing. And his like white Dang. thing was super sexy because like she bought a white nightgown out of spite. Yeah, well, and he's already spite. he's like, yeah. uh, it's out of spite slash. Yeah, not spite, uh, like you, you know. know, like again, he's yeah. very he he did some things. Okay, yeah, it was all right, but it, there was something completely unsexy that he did, and it was only because of the time period. But I will never forget. They were supposed to be sexy. But he's like, at the same moment, he shoved down her pantyhose and his pants. And oh, I'm God, like, the pantyhose. So she's hobbled like a pony? I don't know. Ah, oh, fucking pantyhose. Pantyhose. And it reminded me of the hood in oh, which God. she had the, the pant- side the- zip pants and the pantyhose oh, and the, the pantyhose. Pants. That's yeah. the worst. Yeah, like, fuck whoever. And, and, and the thing is, she actually puts on garter belt yeah. during this. As a thing, but she he doesn't realize like maybe pantyhose are terrible. But he doesn't like it because it's not her. And I do think like it's I, it's definitely wish fulfillment because you want to be somebody else, you want to be amazing, but you also wanted to be like, no, I want her, 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 my thing. And I mean, you know, we're 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 coming up to our last question, but I do think what is interesting about this book and what's kind of. Jude Devereaux, if she just, like, ever, like, let it go and just wrote a straight comedy, would be amazing. Because yeah. she's funny as hell. Like, she's really... Give me a book about the kitchen, still. Oh, my God. She's really, really fucking funny. <laughs> and I think, like I said, she writes really cool, like, what I kind of consider a feminist, like, things. Keenly observed women. Yeah, keenly observed feminist things. And then, like, again, it's a bunch of shit. And the other one, and this is like, hey, here but why it is. lie to her? That's the thing. That, like, why would you lie to her? I don't. She, I mean, like your quote unquote daddy. If your daddy lies to you, it's okay I feel if like, you're four. But I, you you're know, not four anymore. I feel like what could have been. I I don't know if it. I, I don't know. Like, I don't know if. I think that if you're going to do it that way, because, again, the book's called Sweet Liar, but mm-hmm. I think the interesting thing about it, it could have been with her, like, severe, like, because Jude gets into it, like, there's a lawyer at the beginning that's like, hey, oh, this God. girl's hot, but she's obviously been well, through why se- was that there? sexual, like, there's a lot of, like, Sam's been through sexual trauma when she hasn't. I mean, this was, and, this was a lawyer who had been um, her dad's lawyer. And so it was remembering when she was like a oh, kid, like no. a teenager, as a gymnast. And like how he had wanted yeah. to fuck her and then push that on down. Yeah. Like, why is this necessary? I don't know. It's, it's, that's what I'm saying. Like, I feel like if it had been like this, the, the liar portion had been like, I have to introduce you to things in degree because like you've got such severe like emo- I, I don't think that's what it is but I feel like 
I feel like what happened is Jude Devereaux was like, I'm going to write a Danielle Steele novel. Yeah. And... But then I'm going to lose control, but we're going to have a show. The fucking show. The show. The show that came to nothing. Oh, the show that came Why to nothing. Why did you not tell me what happened in the show? This is like the Disney Imagineers put a year into this shit, and then we did not see the show. The fucking show. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's the worst. Okay. All right. So, what pairs nicely with... A dumpster fire. You know what pairs nicely in the 90s with a dumpster fire? What? Or the early 80s, um, considering that I was 21 in uh, 2001. A Behringer White Zinfandel. I feel like this is very much a Behringer, like, joint. Like, it's some pink ass shit. It is super pink and super fun. And we're going to get sick off of it, but... And you can tell the kind of restaurant you're in based on what they are charging for a Behringer White. Uh, and yeah. the funny thing is, you know, I don't know what a Behringer White Zinfandel costs now because I would not drink one on a fucking bat. But I know that back in the day, a Behringer White Zinfandel cost you $11. You know what this dumpster fire actually pairs with? Was is yeah. at <laughs> Kelly and Shannon's house. We would always sneak... Really shitty champagne, and you know I almost got champagne. So I almost did is, because this of is a bad mimosa. So thank you to Miss Grace for letting me steal this book. Thank you to Miss Sally for she- letting me read this book, and thank you to Shannon, Kelly, and April for letting me talk about your mom and your grandmother. Is Miss Grace? Still with us? No. No, she no, passed away, not. but she was amazing. I was going to say, oh my God, if you could get a quote from her oh, about no, this. No, no, she was, be she was super awesome, but. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, but the, uh, they were a super fun family, and I had the best time stealing her grandma's book. Oh, well, that won't be the last one we do that too. So, um, Jude Devereaux. We will not not do another Jude Devereaux. I think there is so much to be plumbed here. Yeah. There is so much. Like, oh my god, my gender studies body is ready. You're ready. Yeah, I have all your gender studies. Can you say you have a gender studies dick? I mean, is that a thing that you can have? Maybe a, a, thing? maybe a strap on. Yeah, okay, my gender, my gender studies strap-on is, is completely ready. ready for more G. Devereaux. There is so much material here. It is fascinating. We would love to hear your opinion on this yeah. business. Um, we are at... We are at Bodice Hibblers on Twitter. Yes. Bodice Hibblers no, on Instagram. No, we are Instagram. at D- B. Tipplers on Twitter. B. Tipplers. Yeah, B. Tipplers on Twitter. Bodice Tipplers on Instagram. Uh, you can go to bodicesiblers.com, or you can always reach us at bodicesiblers at gmail.com. Yeah. And don't forget to check out our Patreon, and go to Frolic Media, find out other podcasts.